Welcome to another A Tippling Philosopher video with myself, Jonathan M. S. Pierce. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Really great to have you on board. We're going to have an interesting live chat tonight. Um, but before I do that, I just want to say a couple of things, which is uh, there might be a bunch of people on this live that have come along from my recent subscriber um, heaven of an extra 3,000 subscribers from doing all my war in Ukraine stuff. And you might be coming on to this live thinking, well, this is going to be about war in Ukraine, and it, it ain't. Uh, so just uh, I'll, I'll let you know up front that but we're going to be talking about philosophy, religion, psychology, religion, and basically personal experiences of, of actually two guys from the same family in leaving that religion. Uh, as And hopefully it will be a way of giving support to others who might be in similar situations. But we'll get on to that in a second. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking to a guy called Ricky, who's a, who's a, a great you know supporter of this channel, um, and his son. Uh, who, and they both agreed to come on and talk about their experiences of Lestadianism something that I'd never heard of until Ricky brought it up in a couple of, uh, of chats um, on some of the lives I've done previously and sort of brought that into the conversation. That was really interesting. I thought, well, here's, here's something I've never heard of. Um, and, and that's always nice to learn new stuff. So anyway, without further ado, uh, welcome to all the new new uh, subscribers and people that might be joining this. Welcome to all, all the new uh, the new member. I've got Craig McElmore, um, who's a new member of the channel. I'd like to give Props to Craig. Thank you for for helping to support everything I do. I don't know whether you are a war in Ukraine guy or a philosophy of religion guy, but hey, we're all one big happy family. Anyway, that's enough of like me talking rubbish. Let's get the guests on. So my guests are Ricky there uh, mm -hmm. and Austin, his son there. Uh, thank you for coming on, guys. Uh, let's, I guess, go to Ricky first to just uh, lay out... I, I guess what what you're trying, what you want to achieve by by our chat tonight. Well, uh, f first of all, I just want to say thanks for having me on the chat, your channel again. I really enjoyed our discussion last week, and I've received a lot of great feedback from uh, so many different people, and particularly uh, ex Lestadians that thank me for uh, giving voice to some of the concerns that they've had over the years. And you know, in these in these type of environments, when you're in a high control religion and you find something problematic and you leave, it's incredibly difficult for people because you kind of get othered, you know, by your family or they're uncomfortable around you and such like that. But um, anyway, for this conversation, I just wanted to preface it by saying that, you know, I'm not, I'm not out to attack, you know, this religion or Ustadianism or anything like that. Um, what, what I'd like is just, if you could have, if people could have just open and honest conversations. And I, and I understand when, you know, when you're discussing religion, it gets, you know, it's a hot button issue and people can, when you hear something that's problematic about your religion from somebody else, it can cause you to be defensive and you might feel persecuted. And a lot of times people feel like, you know, it's a persecution complex where you feel like if somebody's questioning you, they're out to get you and that's not it. And, you know, I just. Yeah, I guess there's a differentiation between a person and their beliefs. Yes. You know, and and if, if we if we are attacking Lestadianism at all, it's it's the beliefs and not the people necessarily who believe that. Although there will be people who hold to views that are pretty destructive that we are going to be talking about as yeah. well. But sorry, yeah, carry on, Ricky. Yeah, and when and the thing is, I mean, like it's typical. Um, I mentioned our last uh, last time I discussion too is that. I've listened to hundreds and hundreds of stories and I, of ex, ex fundamentalists, and I, I mean, literally, I'm not exaggerating hundreds. I'm like probably five a week for the last five years at least. Um, Austin can vouch for that. <laughs> I'm a little bit obsessed, but anyway, typically, people that are still in those religions accuse people that are out of being bitter, and I can assure everybody that I have absolutely no bitterness towards the religion or anybody in the religion. Um, for most part, I feel kind of embarrassed that I didn't listen to, in myself for not having listened to the voice in the back of my head that was there for all those years telling me that these two problematic things I'm hearing, I should be examining them, but then you're conditioned to not examine them. You're, you know, you're conditioned to be afraid of information. And so like in the religion, there's, there's what I call good people. You know, they're really good people. It's just they're lacking information, and it's only because you're conditioned to be afraid of information. So every Sunday when you're told, don't look into things because you'll lose your Christianity, it makes people afraid of information. 
And people people not- are like any sort of function machine, which is garbage in, garbage out. So if you if you if you're getting garbage in, then you're going to be your function machine, your brain is going to be working on very bad intel, and then there's going to be garbage opinions and beliefs coming out. So yeah, yeah. exactly. And I, I mean, the reason I like I enjoy talking about this stuff is to because all I do want to do basically is just help support X X not X fundamentalists but X Lestadians, especially you know people that lose their community. I, you know, whatever little way I can, I want to be there to like help them and, and to say that, you know, you, you may have been told you're crazy because you left, you're not crazy. And, you know, this is what I've found. And, but also, I, you know, I like to say that don't take, I don't want people listening to take my word for anything. Like, look into everything I say. I mean, you know, when you're, when you have preachers telling you that God is speaking through them. And so what I'm saying is from God. Well, you know, question that. Is it really from God? And like when I'm sharing what I think or believe or what my opinions are, don't trust me either. Look, you know, look into everything. Chase down everything. So, like I said at the end of all my videos, which is question everything, particularly yourselves, right? And so, yeah, absolutely. Well, before we get into Austin and, and just get him to talk about his background, uh, uh, about who he is now, where he is now. Uh, Ricky, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, obviously, you've got an interesting accent, so very Fargo-esque for me. So tell us yes. a little bit about who you are and where you're from. Uh, we live in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, which is way up north and lake superior we're we're basically right next to lake superior and then uh canada is across the lake superior from us so and yeah in our region you have kind of that canadian-esque uh accent which in the upper peninsula we call it a uper accent you know up uper so and then yeah in fargo or you know minnesota it's a little bit different sounding but we don't really say a boot like in Canada or something like that. So. <laughs> but we're Good close. Fool yeah. Good for me. Uh, but brilliant. And so what are you doing now? What, where are you in your life now? I, I've been working at the same company for uh, 24 years. In a man, I'm a technical publications in a manufacturing, local manufacturing company. So it's, cool beans. yeah, it's it's been great. I, I mean, I love the UP. Besides the winters do get brutal. They last six months and we'll get like 300 inches of snow. But the summers are amazing. Brilliant. Well, Austin, so son of, um, uh, tell us uh, a little bit about yourself. Where where are you before before we go into the details of how you've got there? Where are you? What are you doing with your life? Yeah, so um, I am currently a visiting assistant professor um, at a university here, Finlandia University. So I am teaching um, biology courses right now. So I finished graduate school um, earlier this year. Um, so I spend my time between um, teaching classes, lab sections, um, and then also doing scientific research as well. So I do field ecology, um, that type of work. So my focus is ecology, evolutionary biology, um, with a particular focus on how human activity influences eco-evolutionary dynamics. Wow. So, uh, and that, that's very interesting when, when, as I uh, have been for years involved in these huge sort of religion, non-religion debates, uh, evolution is, is the hot topic. But in fact, I, I generally don't even dis- debate it anymore because often when you're debating with young earth creationists, they are operating on such a different uh, framework to you that, that they don't evaluate evidence and and facts in the same way that i would and so therefore we we can't really converse like if i'm going to give you some some facts that are pretty damn well established and you're just going to reject them out of hand and we we can't we can't really talk because we're not operating on the same wavelength but for you that's interesting that you are involved in a science b biology c evolutionary biology so how, what talking about your life up, up to now what what was that journey for you into science and uh, did that have is is there any kind of intersection between science and what you believe now yeah there's certainly an intersection and um i think it it played a very large role in where i am today and um i kind of stumbled into it by accident so i uh, went to university after I graduated high school and kind of bounced around and didn't really know what I wanted to do. And eventually I wound up having to take um, an intro college level biology course that was part of the um, curriculum for the program I was in at the time. Um, 
And so I took it, not really thinking anything of it, like, you know, whatever, it's just another class I have to take. But the professor that taught it um, got me really interested in subjects that um, I hadn't really dealt with before or seen in my high school biology experience. So some of those broader ecology evolution type topics. And so um, it really sparked my interest. And so I, it kind of changed my focus and the things I wanted to do. And I just said, I guess I'm going to kind of take a leap and see if I can't get myself into science. Um, and so that was kind of what shifted my focus was taking that intro course. And then the professor who taught that course ended up being my academic advisor as a graduate student. So I worked in his lab. And so we've developed a, a good um, professional relationship over the years. Um, so it was quite a journey that just started off with a, a chance being placed into a class that I had to take that kind of sparked that interest. The inspiring teachers. I used to be a teacher myself, and I'd like to think I inspired people, but I would probably bored them uh, more than inspired them. But hey, you know, there you go. I hey, doubt no that, Jonathan. No loss. <laughs> Thank you. Very kind. So, um, uh, what the devil is Listadianism? Uh, who can give me a, a brief history and then maybe an idea of how, what differentiates that denomination from any other given Christian Christian denomination? Uh, Ricky, do you want to do you want to start? Us yeah, off? yeah. Um, well, Stadianism, it, it started in um, up in uh, what they call Lapland, which is top, you know, Sweden, Norway, Finland, up in that area. And there's there's Sami, Sami people there who most of them were like uh, most of them were reindeer herders, indigenous people. And as as typically happens, um, unfortunately, you know, European settlers came there at some point, and then around the 1700s or so, they started, you know, stripping the land and you're trying to assimilate the people and you're erasing their history and they destroyed statues. They destroyed their drums, you know, all the Sami objects. And so these people, it, it, you know, forced to try to force to assimilate them for, you know, a hundred, few hundred years or whatever. And, um, Lestadius, he, he was, he was part Sami. And so he, he was, a, he was a botanist and, 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 you know, scientist basically he wanted, I mean, I think that's what he would have probably preferred to do. Um, somehow he ended up getting into, you know, into the religion stuff. And then he uh, went up, they assigned him up there and up into the Lapland. And so in about, I think about eight, in mid 18, 1840s or somewhere on there, he uh, had what he called an awakening where he basically found true Christianity. And so that's, that's when the Lestadianism, uh, you know, started, and I, I have something here I could read. I kind of give you an idea. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief here. So I'll just read a portion yeah. of this. Yeah. So go, go for it. So this this year book, and this this is in the Apostle of Wilderness book that uh, somebody written, but it says the remarkable Estadian awakening has started in the village of Caraswando in the fall of 1845. On the 5th of December that year, an earthquake occurred that trembles felt in a 60 mile radius. At that same moment, the first signs of grace appeared. A lap woman who had long been under the law was reconciled and graced, says Lestadius. And he adds, the sign of the grace is a great miracle in the year of, gra in, in the year of grace. For the doubting one, a sign of grace is a voice from heaven that says, your sins are forgiven unto you, or today thou shalt be with me in paradise. By sign of grace, Lestadius meant the receiving of an inner assurance of the forgiveness of sin. Now, this part here is going to describe like what went on then and, and and like i said the you know sammy were indigenous people and you know they believed in animate animism and and stuff like that so um you know and the mysticism and stuff so I'll, I'll read this part here it says many of the awakened ones saw visions and came to experience wonderful moments of indescribable blessed feelings they saw dead relatives and acquaintances in heavens blessedness or in the throes of the abyss they saw christ in his torment and gethsemane or on the cross of Gol Golgotha, they, and also in the glory of resurrection. It happened that one smelled a sulfurous odor for those who are tormented in their consciousness agony. But it also happened that saw uh, light uh, saw light hovering like a halo over those rejoicing for, for their salvation. Even Lestadius related that he saw visions and heard voices. For example, he once saw a blaze of light streaming from the church roof of Caraswando. The same evening he had seen black ghosts trying to put out the church's light, but they were not able to do so. The prince of darkness himself revealed himself in many different guises. One time as a dragon, another time as a bear that lay under his bed and tried to overturn it. 
That gives you an so idea. Some, of yeah, some interesting like exper experiences going on there. Yeah, very uh, I, I, just slight, slight uh, left field, well, not left field, but connected comment here is that um, I always find it interesting that people who have religious experiences never have religious experiences about religions they know nothing about. And, and I always think that's that's that almost tells you all you need to know about religious experiences. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. no one in an Amazonian rainforest sit, sits there after having no um, knowledge about Christianity or Islam and has a Christian experience where, yeah. where they're like given visions of Christianity and suddenly have some knowledge of Christianity. People only have experiences about that which they are told. And Honestly, that almost tells me all you need to know, but I don't know. What do yeah, I, mean? I know what, what that reminds me of, too. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, like when you get in these social social st structures and you have like you see these studies of like everybody's in on the study except for one person and they'll show them th three bars of different heights. And then they'll show one bar over here. That's the same height as one of those three. And everybody else gets to that's in on it says that though this bar matches that one and it's not the right height, you know? So it gets to the last person who's not in on it and they're looking at it and they actually go with what everybody else says and they know full well that bar doesn't match that one. But it's like the whole room said these two are the same height, so I'm going with it. Yeah, if, you that, know, you, yeah. You there, uh, there's loads of really great um, research to suggest that people, uh, both in terms of swarming, so people just physically follow people when they've done loads of experience, um, loads of experiments within like halls and talking about fire calling fire and then people going to fire exits but then the way that people swarm and follow others like sheep but also uh, and counterintuitively also you know not rashly they'll, they'll just follow people uh, but also in terms of moral judgments can really skew just by feeling you have to copy other people so yeah absolutely um so uh austin uh, what do you, do you understand the religion particularly well i don't know what your experiences are will come on to your experience of leaving it but for you uh, in how much you understand the religion, what what differentiates um, Lestadianism with other types of Christian denominations? Well, um, my dad certainly knows more about it than I do. Even he spent the most amount of time, a, a great deal of time on it. So I've actually learned a lot from him as well. Um, but w I guess what kind of differentiated it um, from the other religions that I had been surrounded with um, was just kind of the um, extreme nature of some of the beliefs that the adherents held, um, beliefs about the nature of the universe, um, beliefs about what would happen to their fellow human beings, things like that. Um, so it was very extreme, um, very uh, rigid uh, thinking, kind of like black and white. It's either this or that. There aren't really um, any in-betweens, very dichotomous thinking. Um, so that was that was one big distinguishing feature that um, I guess I didn't really see in as many um, of the other traditions that I had experienced. So it, in a sense, I guess, is, is it true, Ricky, to say that the religion is maybe not greatly different in much of its theology? I don't know, by the way, I'm, I'm kind of asking. Is it not greatly different in its theology, but more in the way it kind of organises itself and the, the, the way in which it is as a community? Do you know what I mean? It's, it's diff I mean, it's different in its theology where it's, um, I'm not sure how I could... Uh... I think how I could describe it, but um, you have, I mean, it, it's based on the, conf it's almost like Luther's confessions, you know, but it's a little different. There's like the laying, laying of the hands, which like members will testify other members sins forgiven in the name of, uh, in the holy name of Jesus and Jesus' blood. And so you have the laying of the hands and stuff like that. So, so laying of the hands being almost like the, the witness of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit, you know, being reborn. That that they'll, that yeah, they'll, they'll embrace yeah, embrace each other and confess sins to each other, and then you know the the person will say, "Well, you can believe all your sins are forgiven in Jesus' holy name and His precious reconciling blood." So, so actually, the other, other, member other, the member. other members of the church can literally forgive the sins. Yeah, of, of you yeah, as you are telling them your deep dark. Yeah, they Secrets. believe they believe the they ha, they believe they have uh, exclusive access to the king uh, keys to the kingdom of heaven, and what's interesting is you know that is like we have you know all these schisms that they've had over the years in Lestadianism, and uh, I sent you that chart of all the you know breakups and stuff, and 
you know, each one of them claims to have the keys to the kingdom. So you have these little, little doctrinal differences and it's enough for the other groups are going to hell, you know, because of yeah. some of it's just, it's, it's so minor. It's, it's kind of unbelievable. I mean, I, I think if Lestadius was here now, he'd be disappointed and surprised that to see like what's happened here. You know, that's, that's not what he w would have wanted. You know, it's, it's very strange, but you get, you know, what happens is you get, you get this, I mean, even if you get any guy that's a little more charismatic, you know, maybe a di little different thoughts and few people want to go his way. The other ones want to stay. And then eventually they're all uh, calling, you know, each other heresy and these ones aren't saved. And, and so yeah, like well, that that's really interesting. So from the Wikipedia page on Lestadianism, uh, there there's the true Christian's doctrine. The, the true true Christians is like a thing. It's a, it's a it's a term. So the true Christians doctrine, which is another core teaching, concerns essential differences in lifestyle and beliefs between true believers on one hand and false Christians, sometimes distinguished as living faith versus dead faith, and unbelievers on the other. So yeah. it's almost differentiating true Christians, false Christians, and non-believers. But true Christians. You know, Lestadianism, I suppose, as every denomination has, thinks it has the the that access to true Christianity. And in fact, uh, it says the next section is exclusion and inclusion among Lestadian sub subgroups. The leaders of the two largest Lestadian subgroups, the conservative Lestadians and the firstborn Lestadians. Yeah. And the first, oh, sorry. Yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah. The firstborn old apostolic Lutheran church, that's the one that we are in. And that's, I'd say that's just that's the strictest one and it's probably the closest to what Lestadius, you know, to the actual original Lestadianism. So it says here, have for decades excluded each other and all other Lestadian subgroups from the kingdom of heaven, even though the denomination's core doctrines are nearly indistinguishable. So this is absolutely fascinating. And I'm going to tell you a joke, right? So the, the uh, so if you're looking at the screen, all those different sort of Lestadian positions, like one thinks the other is just as like going to hell as a non-believer effectively as far as i can work out which is really interesting but there's a great emo phillips joke and i mentioned this in our ch chat last time but i'm going to read it out to you so here's a joke it's a classic in fact i think it got voted the best joke in uh the in a ship of fools poll so uh emo phillips says once i saw this guy on a bridge about to jump i said don't do it he said nobody loves me i said god loves you do you believe in god he said yes i said are you a Christian or a Jew? He said, a Christian. I said, me too. Protestant or Catholic? He said, Protestant. I said, me too. What franchise? He said, Baptist. I said, me too. I said, uh, 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 me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? He said, Northern Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lakes Region or Northern Conservative Baptist, Eastern Region. He said, Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lakes Region. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. He said, Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. I said, die heretic, and I pushed him over. <laughs> and that's so, uh, yeah, and that and that's exactly what it's like. And I had mentioned in our last one too about I you know reading before about a, a town that had like four different branches of of the Amish, uh, and you know each one of them pointed at the others that they're going to hell, and it's just slim doctrinal differences, and it's enough to say you're not saved, we're saved, and you got everybody pointing at each other. It's just. It's just, you know, it's just, it's very sad because it causes so much division in, in, you know, families and so many people lose their community over just the most minor things. And it's heartbreaking when, you, especially when families split down the middle and some go one way, some go the other, and then they wow, don't want yeah. to talk to each other. You know, I can't, I don't want to spend time around the heretics. And it's like, what's the real difference here? Well, we think forgiveness of sin should be this way. Oh, we think it should be that way. And it's still similar, but still enough to say, yeah, you're going to hell. <laughs> Wow. So and um, we're going to get on to that now, sort of um, how to uh, talk about the social uh, psychological aspects of the religion as, as pertains to your lives. Uh, Chindi, who's a member and a legend. Um, thank you for the super chat. Ten dollars. That's so generous. I really appreciate Chindi. He's a lovely guy. Came on last time to speak with, with yourself, actually, Ricky, when we had a, a members chat session. Mm -hmm. um, I've never heard about the stadianism until Ricky had spoken about it. I also do need a debate. And this is coming from Chindi, who's a who's a Christian. I also do need a debate 
debate uh, nor uh, debate with young earth creationists jp for the same reason you stated yeah it doesn't get you very far um, basically you end up banging your head against a brick wall which i'm sure austin has had his experience of as an evolutionary biologist thank you so much cindy by the way so uh, austin let's let's get back to yourself um i well i guess it would be mm, uh, before we talk to ricky about what led him to deconvert uh because obviously that happened first before you um no, oh okay right right brilliant uh, okay so this is interesting sorry my bad so austin before you talk about your deconversion journey what was what did you see that the religion was in your community how did it operate how did it feel destructive to you or wrong to you at that time and how old were you and how did you start coming to your doubts well one thing and this ties into kind of what you asked um, a moment ago um that really kind of distinguishes that tradition from some of the other um religions um in the area is that they are um very i guess ill-defined or kind of nebulous when it comes to many different um topics so they have some very well-defined beliefs about um very specific religious principles things like the the um, nature of um, forgiveness and things like that. Um, but when it comes to a kind of overall broad ontology about the world, um, they they didn't really contend with a lot of that. Um, you could ask five different church members about explaining dinosaurs or something and you'd get five different answers. There was no um, kind of unified ex explanation for some of these difficult scientific topics that were um at odds with their beliefs which is, is that because there's no central you know like C catholicism has a central doctrinal approach to life where the pope says something the, the vatican says it gives out these these papal decrees and like everyone knows what as a catholic you're supposed to believe is there, is there no kind of centralized understanding of that in in the studyism well i would say that there is because what the preachers say is supposed to be um, consistent with one another. So they're all supposed to believe the same thing and being of one mind, as they would call it. And um, these people believe that what the preachers say is actually God directly speaking through them. So it's not even actually them as a human being. It is just God using them as a microphone or a speaker to tell you what to think or what you're supposed to believe. So in principle, there should be some type of unified explanation for those type of things. But I think that it just comes down to avoidance and not even really contending with those topics at all until being pressed about it. Somebody has to bring it up to them and then say, well, how do you explain this? Or how does this fit into your belief system? At which point they have to formulate some type of response on the spot and then you get different responses every time depending on what kind of spontaneously comes into the person's brain wow so um yes one one, one thing quick thing to relate, relate to like you're talking about the catholic church and the pope uh th we have what they call the elders that are in sweden so there's there's a group of men in sweden that um like the preachers in the u.s would uh they consult with them on any th difficult topic that they couldn't answer. Right. Um, and uh, I think someone has just asked, where's it gone? Um, uh, here we go. So JW No Mole says, uh, how many Lestadians are there uh, today and how do they have churches? Uh, so actually, if we go and look at, oops, not that one. Let's do that. And um, no, it's not that. Uh, sorry, this is my inability to use tech in any kind of, um, you know, modern way. A word on me. Uh, so I think this is quite an interesting little breakdown. This is just from the Wikipedia page. So you've got conservative Lestadianism, 115,000 people in Finland, USA, Sweden, Russia, Togo, blah, 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 Kenya, Ghana, Gambia. So interesting, stretching to a uh, number of places. Firstborn. Um, uh, in in uh, USA, so somewhere less than 115,000 people, then 21,000 people in little firstborn group. And then it's interesting, it just quickly goes down to like Davidites, uh, 40, uh, Gunderson group, 30 in Norway. And then at the bottom one's Contio group, five people in Finland. <laughs> it's just fascinating. Yeah, and there's, there, there's, been, there's been more splits recently too. So um, so like the chart I sent you wasn't updated. There's There had been another one, I guess, in... Um, 
I think in Minnesota there was a group that split recently too. Yeah. So, um, so okay. So Austin, what? Uh, talk us through that that kind of deconversion journey and and what the problems you saw with the the psychosocial um, issues with with Listadianism. Yeah. So th- there were really many different things that occurred at a number of different periods in my life. Um, so I, I would say that those initial seeds of doubt were planted at a very, very young age. Um, so ever, ever since I was a, a young child, I would kind of wrestle with and think about kind of what people kind of refer to as the big questions, right? Fundamental questions about the nature of the universe and our existence and our place in it. And um, I would ask people about about things, right? Um, you know, well, if... if God created everything, where did God come from? Or something like that, right? And the response that I would get from the adults in that community was very troubling to me because I would expect some type of reasoned response or something, but it would be kind of angry. Like, what are you even doing thinking about that? Why are you asking a question like that? You don't ask stuff like that. And so that set off red flags at a very young age um, because I thought, well, why is it necessarily wrong to just wonder that or just ask that? Right. It's OK if you're an adult to just say, well, I don't know, or have or come up with some type of response rather than be um, met with anger. So I, I think even from a young age, I would kind of think of those types of things. And the fact that adults who when you, you know, when you're a child, you think adults, they know everything. Right. They have it all figured out and I can trust them and rely on them to give me an accurate description of the world I live in so that I know what to do. But the fact that the adults around me were meeting these questions with anger um and they would appear to be uncomfortable by them it kind of made me feel like something was off or something was was wrong and and made me have a doubt for it because um having that type of a response seemed very suspicious um suspicious to me and just the kind of some of the big kind of theological ideas started to seem suspect um just because of how people responded to questions about them what what give me an example of of a couple of the issues that that played played on your mind? Well, I mean, even even going to the existence of of God in general. So, um, just the entire idea of the monotheistic concept um, that you know many religions have today. Um, there was always kind of something about that that didn't seem quite right to me, um, and a, a big a big part of that was just how poorly people were able to defend it, but especially within the church itself, because um, the things that the preachers are saying, again, are believed to be the actual words of God himself. And so as a child, I would think, well, if this is actually God speaking and not just a human being trying to think of a response, why is it such a poor response? Right? Why is this such a bad answer? Right? I'm, I'm young and I can tell that this is full of holes and, and frankly, kind of silly. So why would why would God either intentionally try to mislead me by saying something foolish or not know the answer to the question? Yeah, uh, presumably, he wants me to know that he exists and then um, remain a member of that church so that I can be saved because they also think that he wants people to be there in heaven with him. So in principle, he should give me a correct response or at least prevent me from um, losing my faith. Yeah, and if he's gonna, if he was to give you a, a response that was uh, inadequate, I mean, the consequence for that could be going to hell. So why would he be a trickster like that? You know? Yeah, yeah, and what what for you, Ricky, was some of the? I mean, because we have we haven't talked about some of the the sins and how conservative the religion is, and we'll get onto that in just a second. Yeah. But what what were some of the philosophical uh, challenges or you know things that that, that made you sow seeds for you, Ricky? Well, I, like in our last discussion, I mentioned too that I was I was really young when I I realized I don't I didn't feel comfortable like I was a square peg in a round hole. But it's it's amazing like what conditioning can do to make you stay in an environment, especially since I didn't leave into my forties. You can stay in an environment that you know your half your brain's telling you that there's so many problematic things here. And what like when I was young, I mean, guess what would be problematic is that. I I have experience with people, you know, I, I, I had friends and, you know, things I do with them that were, were quote-unquote worldlies, and I thought they were f- 
far better people than I was. So it's like, why would I be born with what, you know, what the preachers would say is a silver spoon in your mouth. I heard that, you know, preached many times that we were born with a silver spoon in our mouth. You know, we're, we're so fortunate. Other people out in the world aren't, they say they're happy, but they're not truly happy. Like we're the only happy people. And so that was all problematic to me. It's like, okay, I just happen to be born into this religion and it, which is going to give me a, a, a step ahead, of, uh, you know, to, to getting to heaven when all these other people aren't going to get that same chance. It, it didn't make sense to me. I'm like, like my friends and stuff like that. I thought they're far nicer than I am. You know, they're, they're just much better people. They, just, they wouldn't do anything to warrant everlasting destruction. And, you know, regarding the, you know, silver spoon in your mouth and, and saying that, you know, we're, nobody else is truly happy and only we are. What was fascinating about listening to the stories of hundreds and hundreds of ex-fundamentalists is that almost every one of them shared that same thing, whether it was Jehovah Witness or Mormons or Hooderites or you go on and on and on. They, they were conditioned to believe the same thing. They were told, you know, you were born a silver spoon in your mouth. Lucky for you, you were born into this church because all the other churches aren't saved and you know, you were just so fortunate. And I'm like, they all heard the same thing. It's just like, let, let me take this opportunity to spam uh, the feed with uh, my book, 30 Arguments Against the Existence of God, Heaven, Hell, Satan, and Divine Design. That's my latest book. And the reason I'm spamming that is because exactly what you're just talking about, there's several chapters in here about the unfairness of God uh, um, and uh, God's hiddenness, but also uh, God's distribution of humans around the world. So it's like, what? how come there are um, Amazonian tribes people? born in 5000 BCE that, that have no access to the revelation of, of, of the true, you know, Christianity or God or whatever, uh, you know, how, how does that happen? So this whole silver spoon thing, which is like, why does God allow people to be born in Riyadh who are definitely going to be Muslims, that if they had been born into the same church area as you in, in your hometown, Ricky and Austin, that they would have been Lestadians, no problem. This is in philosophy, this or uh, philosophy of religion, this is called non-resistant non-believers. So non-resistant non-believers believers are people who would believe so they're non-resistant I, mean, I would believe in Lestadianism for example you can talk about any religion I would be a, a Muslim I just wasn't born in a place that allowed me to be that uh, and and all the social constraints have, have made me become disbelief right so I've got the wrong one but it's not as a fault of my own it's it's the literally the luck uh, and history the luck of the geography and history of my birth so yeah. that's a really it's, 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 you've you've summed up that argument perfectly well but it's a brilliant philosophical argument yeah and i'll i'll, I'll share with you the church narrative it is on that and i also have a story to share about a, a mormon missionary that was fascinating too but for the church narrative it would be every single person on this planet at some point is going to have the opportunity to know what you know the real christianity and i mean really? And, yeah. And <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't want to, I mean, I don't mean to laugh because I don't want to make people feel bad for their beliefs or whatever, you know, but I mean, that, that isn't, that is one of those things where you call mental gymnastics that you, you wonder when, when people say that and, and when they hear that, like how many really believe that? Yeah. Cause I know when I heard that in the church, like I couldn't, like, the, you know, even with cognitive dissonance said and everything, I, it was like, no, like, no, it just, it's, and people, you know, when I've questioned or when I've questioned people that, which I discussed in our last thing too, is that I've never, I've never went out and talked to anybody from the church and tried to deconvert them or tell them what I think or anything. I, I never went out to talk to anybody. I would only respond to people that came to talk to me, which might've been six to eight people total after I left. And I'd ask, you know, ask that question, you know, and they'd say, well, no, you know, it, everybody's going to have their opportunity at some point, you know. And I'm like, well, how many people from Brazil have ever made their way up to the UP of Michigan to come to our church? I don't know of any. And it's so like, well, it, if, it's, if they're it's, truly it's, praying to God, they'll come. It's like, so their <laughs> prayers aren't real. They're not trying hard enough. I mean. I mean, come on. It's yeah, as, as those sort of things. You're right. It's, it, it, that annoys me because it's real hand wavy. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, Everyone it's, to get their yeah. chance. Everyone to get their chance. Okay, right. I, I hear you've said that. It's an assertion. How do they get that? How does that work? Like, let's delve a little bit deeper. Yeah. And then I guess that's the time when they just get angry with you. And, and that's, the, that's the thing is like, you, you'd ask the, you know, you ask the preacher this, and, and I remember asking the preacher this. 
And you'll get that answer that they'll all have their chance. And that's that's it. Like that's the end of discussion. No, they're all gonna get their opportunity. You know, you gotta believe that. And then that's the end of it. And you walk away still thinking, no, it's, it's just but you gotta accept it because God's speaking through them, which I still didn't think that God was speaking yeah. through them. So I'm like, that's that answer doesn't carry any weight. But then as I was saying to it, I want to share a quick story about this Mormon missionary I'd read about. He went on a mission to, like you said, to some somewhere in jungle or something, met some tribe. They could not understand the concept of Jesus or what was the need for Jesus. His people were incredibly happy. I mean, he was blown away by how happy that whole tribe was. They had no so, need for any religiosity. I and think that you're Mormon referring... came home and he left the religion. He's like, yeah. this doesn't make any sense. I think you're referring to Dan Everett and you're referring to the tribe. It's a Piraha tribe. That probably and, is there. And, I read a few years yeah, ago. So, yeah. And who who are, I don't think some people are challenged this, but they're famously one of the very few tribes or groups of people who are sort of naturally non-religious uh, uh, that i think they're more animistic but but um uh, but he yeah he they were like really happy and he like really admired the way they lived and then he deconverted as he went as a missionary to try and mm-hmm. convert them and mm-hmm. he ended up deconverting as a result so yeah sorry i interrupted you though but um let, let's okay before we continue to delve a little bit into your own personal journeys let, let's get a, a handle on how strict Lestadianism is in a, in the social context. Um, so let's go to the young one here, Austin, mm-hmm. like uh, as a, as a modern, I don't know, uh, person, I don't know whether you're a millennial or what, uh, I'd get confused about all these terms, but how, how, how does Lestadianism jive with modern life? How is it, is it a bit like Footloose, the film, uh, you know? <laughs> well, um, you know, it, it's very strict, but also people don't necessarily adhere to the rules to the degree that they pretend to, I think. Um, so when I was growing up, every young person did a whole lot of things that you're not supposed to be doing, but then just kind of kept it a little um, on the down low. So you just didn't talk about it a whole lot, but people would go and go to the movie theater and see movies or listen to music. Um, so, well, explain that because obviously a lot of the viewers won't understand this. I mean, you say that yeah. Yeah, so like, you, as if that was a bad thing to do, but that literally right. was a bad thing to do. So they don't, they don't advise people to consume media from um, what they would describe as the world. So the outside world. So things like movies, television, um, music, any of that type of thing, entertainment in general, really, it's just kind of a, a pleasure of the flesh. So it's not something that you need to be engaging in and you should actively avoid because it is going to um, cause you to commit um, sins or have bad thoughts or things like that. So you weren't Does supposed include to go... drink, drink and tattoos. Yeah, no, you, no me... tattoos, no alcohol consumption. You want me to read a little list that I've written here? It's, this doesn't cover everything, but it's a few things just to get just to spur on some more thought here. Yeah, because look, uh, before you do, like I'm excited about this uh, religion. I want to join. This is going to be easy. This is going to be like wholesome. Uh, let's see what what I can do and what I can't. And so here, here's a list of some things that are either sin or else they would call disobedience, which isn't technically sin, but it's something you should still repent of because. You're being disobedient to the, you know, advice of the preachers. But anyways, jewelry, music, um, women shouldn't wear their hair down. Um, men shouldn't have beards. Jonathan, you're going to hell. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's absurdies, man. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, it's still, it's too much facial hair. Um, women should, shouldn't be wearing pants. And what the elders from Sweden would come here, I, you know, every four years ish or so. And um, when I was still in the church, and when they were here like four years ago, they preached quite a bit about women's apparel and stuff. And I remember one of them preaching that there is never a time where a woman should not have a dress on, ever. And they also preached about open-toed shoes shouldn't be worn at church. And they also preached about a heel shouldn't be high enough that a mouse could crawl under it. So I mean, this, so I, I had Bruce these, Grant. I had Bruce Garenza on uh, as an interview a couple of about a month or so ago. And he was talking, he was a pastor in like a bunch of different churches, very conservative, uh, but not, not Lestedianism. Uh, but he was talking about how pants or as we'd say, trousers on women was like a massive no, no, like just in, in loads of the church he used to go to. And it's just like, 
Yeah, and then uh, women don't cut their cut their hair. Although you know, I think it's some some trim it, but you keep it up in a bun, so you know, you can't really tell if it's cut or you know. And, and some don't too. There's some that are very strict and don't cut it. Even split ends they might cut, but that's about it. Uh, no TV, no you know, watching any programs, no going to plays, um, no makeup, hairstyles, or, no no hairstyling, no curling. Um, women's heads need to be covered in church. And it's kind of like the uh, cat, you know, some of the stricter Catholics still do that too. Um, you know, no reading, no romance novels, no parades, fairs, carnivals, circuses. Um, there are some exceptions. Though. There, are, there are some communities that actually do go to, to the fairs and parades. And it, it's, it's interesting to me is that when you say you're one-minded, but then some communities do and some communities don't. And if, you know, if you question that, they'd say, well, you know, each person gets their own advice and stuff. Um, no drinking alcohol. You're eating at establishments with serve alcohols frowned on. Um, women or girls can't sit next to boys in church unless you're married. And of course, they warn con you know constantly about dating or marrying outside of the church because you know the person your significant other may pull you away from the church. And then uh, social media is you know what they and I, I'm quoting a, a preacher here directly that said that social media. Christians shouldn't be on social media. It's disobedience. Mm -hmm. And if a Christian is on social media, they should repent of that disobedience. And uh, I mean, there's, I don't know what percentage of churches on social media, but it's a large percent because I see them on there and I'm connected to some of them too. So, but what's fascinating too is like some of these things, they'll say the doctrine doesn't change and in, in stuff. So you have to stay this strict. But in the past, there was a time where curtains were pre preached to be wrong and bicycles and, so things do change a little bit over time, you know. I, I was going to talk a, bit, a little bit later about uh, whether it's likely to adapt as a movement, but I, I just want to, I'll ask that next, but there's an interesting point to what you're both talking about, which is listing all these things, which are ostensibly enjoyable things, right? Going to the cinema, styling your hair, just feeling good about yourself and, and the way you look isn't necessarily about pride and, and you know, uh, or the, the vanity but it's just like yeah if I, I want to dress like that wear my hair like that or if i want to just uh, like drink a beer or or um enjoy this film or enjoy a play or like a stimulating intellectual play this isn't like uh, so there's an interesting disconnect between what we are designed by god to enjoy to be able to enjoy like and then what is a sin so at the end of the day, it becomes this is it ends up from my philosophical point of view being an argument against this kind of god, or at least making this god look a bit uh, sadistic because it, it turns out that God has designed us to enjoy the things He's also decreed that are sins, uh, and that is a really bizarre thing to do. Like you know, it's tempting. You're tempting. You're literally trying to tempt someone. Uh, and then as soon as they go, go on, go on, eat from this bowl of chips, eat from this bowl of chips, you eat from that bowl of chips. Uh, and you're like, uh, uh, yeah, that's not very nice. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, so it's, you're supposed to, you know, resist those temptations to sin and, you know, you don't want to follow the fashions of the world and, and stuff like that. But uh, anyway, Austin, you can go on. I'm um, sorry. Another thing um, that you should add to that list is um, taking personal vacations as well. Um, so that was another thing that was advised against. Um, you're not supposed to go on like a family vacation unless you're traveling for a church reason. So people still do it, of course, all the time, but technically you're not supposed to. Yeah. For those, for life, for life choices like that, um, you, you know, you're supposed, you're supposed to run by the preacher for any, anything you got going on in your life. You're like given some people, you know, ask them, should I buy this vehicle or not? And then like a vacation is like Austin's talking about, if you were to go ask them, you know, you wouldn't go ask them, you know, could I go to Disney World or something? Because, you know, they're going to advise no. So you just kind of go and then you come back and, you know, and. Can I, oh, I'm just going to be seeing my, uh, my grandparents. So yeah, I'm, they, I'm going they to. They live in Orlando. I'm going to, I'm going to Florida to, uh, well, yeah, the grandparents would only be living in Orlando if uh, either they're uh, from the world. They weren't originally from the church because most people stay to. No, the they're trying to, they're, they're missionaries. <laughs> they're really trying to convert all these holiday makers. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's the thing too. They don't they don't go on missions or try to pull people in the church. It's only you're preaching the choir, and most of the people that end up coming that are from outside with you know would be through relationships, girlfriend, boyfriend, yeah. you know, people getting married and stuff like that. So 
So this is a really interesting uh, point to move on to. And thank you so much, Dale, uh, for your super super chat there. Five dollars. Really appreciate that. Thank you. It allows me to continue to do what I do. Um, so really, really do appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, a point that has been made in, in different ways. And I was going to uh, say it. Individuality is highly discouraged in the church. Now, this is the idea that if things can only be done as if it's given permission by this one central person, then you've got this real sense of control like a church community uh, i would it appears to me would be just really focused on the church and really focused on this one person who is the conduit of god right so the, the power that this person has and then it's like you can't marry outside of this church community i don't want you messing with worldlies you know and people that are not part of us and it just keeps a really us and them sense going and it's a very cultish way it really is a cultish way of of operating religion is, is would, does that sound accurate yeah you're taught to fear the world as it's it's almost as if you're taught to feel fear the world because they're trying to take your christianity away like 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 anybody gets up in the morning and says i'm gonna go out and get some of those uh people from that apostolic church no i i don't think so and oh regarding that list of sins too you know all the different branches too there's there's a large variety of what is what is and isn't sin. And some of them have their hair curled. Others may wear ties, which, you know, the church I was in, you don't wear ties. You're not supposed to wear ties. It's the fashion of the world. Or another one, it you may have all the similarities in the world, but the difference is they wear ties and then, you know, they uh, have a little, few more allowances and maybe they play sports or whatever. There's, which is, I think, well, at least these splits is, you know, somebody says, well, this isn't so bad, you know, let's, we should be able to do this. And then all of a sudden somebody's like, you know, heathen. And then, Oh, another, another religion created, you know, another new church. <laughs> yeah. But some are like, you know, the one I was in has a Lutheran in the title and other ones do say, you know, Lestadian church and, and uh, there's first apostolic, there's old apostolic. There's, you know, there's, those those are the guys that are allowed to do temp in bowling, aren't they? They're, 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 that's a one shirt. That's their schism. Yeah, you can't. They, like, <laughs> they like theologically argue for temp in bowling. Yeah. <laughs> like, ah, oh, damn it, heretics. Yeah. Um, so uh, for, for you, for you, Austin, um, growing up, what was you? Because I mean, uh, I'm interested in how you got to deconvert before your father. There's an interesting thing going on there. But as you growing up as just a, a normal kid, obviously trying to, you you're saying that you broke these rules and that was quite normal but then at some point i guess you get old enough to not break those rules or have to make a decision whether this is something you're going to adhere to and then uh, you decided to go to university to learn like evil stuff like science and biology it, it, is that you know is that then what cemented your your own personal schism yeah, I, I would say that, um, you know, my adherence to um, that church and that tradition and just every everything that they were about in general was um, always teetering on a knife's edge and um, just needed a little a little push to um, solidify my decision to no longer be um, associated with that community. Um, and really in my earlier years as a teenager, um, it was just kind of avoidance right not looking into things because it was just easier to be like well i'm not going to worry about it right now and i'm going to go about my life and be a teenager and hang out with my friends and i'll worry about it later but i know that i kind of you know think this is bullshit um you know just to be blunt but mm. um but then once i got to the point where i was in in college and then having to take things like science courses um i thought well it's time to kind of just rip the bandaid off and contend with this material and then um, follow the evidence where it leads and reach whatever conclusion that is warranted and then deal with it. Right. And just figure out how to deal with it, no matter how troubling it is. So um, of course it's going to be troubling to have to leave a community like that. It's going to make your family members upset. Um, it also is um, scary because then you have to figure out, like, okay, this is obviously not true. And then you have to kind of construct your ontology from the ground up and your picture of the world from, from the ground up. So 
Don't don't make me span again, Austin. Don't make me span again. But this is another book I've written recently called Why I Am Atheist and Not Atheist, How to Do Knowledge, Meaning and Morality in a Godless World. And the idea is that uh, the front cover is build it is a brick wall. You've got to build your understanding of the world and reality from the bottom up. Don't start from the top down and go, right, I'm going to believe in the Bible and I'm going to construct my entire understanding of the world from the Bible downwards because you're there's a castle in the air and then you're constructing the stilts that go down they're all rickety and it's going to fall apart you go build solidly from the ground up starting with the very basics of reality and then see where it takes you so yeah sorry yeah for that and, opportunity. and that's a that's a, a challenging thing to do because mm. when it comes to certain topics like um morality work. ethics meta ethics those types of questions um that, that's a hard place to kind of start from nothing with and build your understanding from the ground up right you start out in a religion like this where you have this framework that's presented to you about how to understand what's right and what's wrong and once you realize that um that that is predicated on something that's inaccurate and you leave a faith like that you're stuck now with having to build it from the ground up and ask questions like what does it mean for something to be moral or immoral or how do we discover those types of things how do we live a good life how do we um navigate ourselves in the world and and um so you have to learn a lot. You have to. I've, I've talked about that in a, in a bunch of recent ones, probably actually with you as well, Ricky, in the, la in the last one where we chatted. Um, the, the idea that that actually a lot of people, so in the free thought thinking community, in the free thought community, which I'm a part of, which is like, it's great to think, you, no one's going to tell me what to think. And isn't that liberating? And, and we go, that's brilliant, right. And now I've got to work out how it all works right and you think that's a great thing but actually most people or at least a lot of people don't really like that it's really hard work because you have to then create your understanding of reality starting with nothing starting with basically nothing and then delving around looking at all the evidence and building your worldview rather than going to church on a sunday and someone tells you everything you need to know about reality and that's it that's that's everything I need to know. And actually, people like there's a lot of people who like that. It's like I don't want to have to just do all the hard work of thinking for myself. Sometimes I've got a job that I'm working like 80 hours a week. It's really tough. I don't have time to think like well, what is morality and what's the meaning of life. I go to church on Sunday for God to tell me that through this conduit. And then job done, I can then operate. It's really easy. It all makes sense if I don't think too much about it. And then I can go li live my life and go to heaven. Yeah, is that, is that kind of about right? Yeah, it's understandable why you know why a lot of people or most people would go to, go down that path. Um, you know, rebuilding when in my mid forties or whatever was, you know, it's destabilizing for a while because your your part of your brain is so sure of something, and then when you challenge, you know, what do I actually know? What do I really know? And you start realizing you don't really know much of anything. And you, like you said, you start building from the ground up. Which, um, which I again, enjoy that. Hard, but. Yeah, but that's harder for you, Ricky. For, if you left, genuinely left, like properly, the Band-Aid was off for you when you were in your 40s, right? But for Austin, he's like this young guy going to college. Mm -hmm. I'm just beginning life. I can now fill my mind up and it's not actually full of i'm not replacing stuff i'm actually filling it up as i go whereas you've already filled your mind up with stuff and now you have to take that out and put new stuff in and that's more difficult so do you think that that your kind of deconversion was possibly more difficult than your son's i i guess it's it's, it's well in the sense that it was was because i think i had established more you know, all the years in the church, you have more connections with people. So you have more people in your life that you know you're going to disappoint, where Austin didn't have that as big of a social web within the church. Um, but I will say throughout most of my time in the church, growing up um, into my adulthood, I always kept people a little bit at a distance because I didn't want anybody to know the real me. So I was always hiding that part of myself. I, you know, and so you're, it's like you're playing, you're, you're playing but this Did you game. not think that God knew you, though? I, I think like, God, if yeah. you're hiding, if you're hiding from other church members, you go, "Oh, it's all right. They I, don't know that I secretly go to the cinema on a Tuesday night or whatever." Like, but but uh, but God knows, right? No, I, God's I, I thought God way. knows me, and in those environments, a lot of people are trying very hard to hide the parts of themselves that they don't. I think they're more afraid of the social pressure than they are of actually of 
what God's right. You know, so bef- about them. yeah, before I get onto J Dub No Mo, has got a question which, which is relating to exactly this. Uh, that 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 reminds me. That I think this is a really important question, and for both of you, what was it that that really deconverted or 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 was a co- the major the more major cause of your deconversion? Was it those big theological and philosophical questions about God in general about okay I'm starting to think this whole God thing doesn't make sense and therefore I'm going to reject Lestadianism or did you reject Lestadianism initially at least or mainly because of those social control things and the social conservatism that then this all feels wrong I this shouldn't be wrong and 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 that's what made you leave Lestadianism and then kind of God followed along with that does that make sense to the question? Yeah, Austin, you can answer him first. Yeah, um, so I, I think our paths on this were, were somewhat different. Um, and mine, it was more general. So um, really, when I started learning about some of the kind of big um, topics in in science, things like biology that just were not acknowledged um, by the church, um, I remember specifically learning about hominin evolution and the multiple different human species that existed concurrently and thinking like, wow, this really doesn't line up with anything that they say or believe. And there's extremely good evidence for the fact that multiple human species existed concurrently um, several hundred thousand years ago. Um, and so that kind of crumbled rather quickly. And um, so I kind of went back to the, the fundamental question of, of theism um, in general, right? Looking at um, right. like, is there even good reason to um, believe in any type of monotheistic entity at all? Um, and really diving into that, um, I could reach another conclusion, but no, there's just no good reason to really believe it other than just doing it based on faith. But it would be inconsistent or, I guess, biased of me to accept one uh, deity on faith and not another, right? Why should I believe in um, Yahweh over some other god? Um, it just didn't make sense, right? If so you, you multiple... kind of you became a, generally an atheist, and mm-hmm. by you know by point of fact that you're an atheist, you are a non listadian Yep. Yeah. And so for you, Ricky, was was it slightly different? Was it more of a of a social community kind of thing? that that was that was giving you the most problems at least initially uh no for for myself it's um like i said if from a young age all the way up till you know just before i i left i had uh like i said never felt like i fit in like there's always too many things that were like i said the voice in the back of my mind was there's problematic things there but i pushed them away for years and for decades and the, thing, the problem is I got I got more and more like uh, depressed as the years went by. I get it far farther and farther down into depression, and when it hit when I hit a forty, it just got severe. Like for a couple of years, it was it was hard for me to function because, and I didn't know why. And so you, you know you're not getting any answers. I'm praying fervently for years, just praying fervently, nothing. So finally, it's like okay you know, you realize I got to, I got to find out what's going on here. So I started, you know, just dabbling a little here, a little there, like, you know, learning things about psychology and, and human behavior and stuff like that. And it was just little baby steps here and there. And that's when you started to get answers for, you know, why, why I was battling this depression so bad. And it's because I, I wasn't living, authentic, I wasn't living authentically. And then, you know, cognitive dissonance from hearing things that, you know, I, I knew not to be true. So if you're hearing things in a church that you find problematic and you're trying to do mental gymnastics to believe it, it, it just took its toll on me. And then the more I learned about psychology and human behavior, all the pieces of the puzzle came together. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not living authentically. This is, this does not work for me. And at the same, you know, and then also I started studying the Bible and studying the Bible. I found a lot of things that were, um, different than what I was hearing at church, things that didn't match up or whatever. But as I'm studying the Bible and learning things about the history of Christianity, which the history of Christianity is fascinating, it, it's shaped so much of our culture. I am finding that, you know, there's there's so many things that it's like you find problematic. And it's like the more I find things, I find, you know, there's things in the Bible where you're told the King James Version is inerrant. 
and you're finding errors in it. And then the preacher's up there preaching and telling you, you know, this is the word of God and it's inerrant. And I know that it's not. I'm like, well, God's not Something's speaking through go. them or God's lying. Yeah. So if God is speaking through them. He's lying to me. This is why you know, he's and I fall. I'm going to hell because he tricked me or something. That you know. So people, people like Bart Ehrman have a lot to to be. You know, a lot of credit needs to be given but to authors like Bart Ehrman, who often are those kind of authors that open up this world of biblical exegesis mm -hmm. and analysis for for those intelligent lay people who are willing to go down that route. And he does such a good job with his books mm -hmm. of yeah. doing that. And I think that you you kind of were one of those, weren't you? Yeah, and there's one point I should make related to that too. The the preachers in the church, they don't they don't go to seminary at all. They say that they're in the school of the Holy Ghost. So it's like the, they don't know context for a lot of things. So it's like when when you actually take time to you know study the history of Christianity, and and you and you find errors and such like that, they don't know because they don't ever go to seminary. They don't study this stuff mm -hmm. in there. So they see they see like you know the Bible is just like everything in here is just all lines up and it's all perfect. And it's like you know like when I had people from, you know, after I left, people come talk to me and I'd ask them questions about history of Christianity or say something in the Bible, like, do you know there's errors in here? And no, it's inerrant. And I said, what if I showed you one error? They don't want me to show them. And it's like, you know, cognitive dissonance and that's scary. It's like, I don't want to know. I'm like, I could show you just one example, but you know that if you show them an example, that's pulling that thread. And yeah, great. it's how it's cards. Like, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, uh, and something else you said, uh, spam, spam the clock again, uh, third time lucky. Um, uh, argument number 18 in here is about divine hiddenness. And uh, divine hiddenness is, we've already mentioned it, in, in you can see it in lots of different contexts non resistant non believers, people in the Amazonian rainforest or whatever, uh, someone born in Riyadh, not being a Christian, you know, these kind of things. But also, there's uh, divine hiddenness arguments to do with actual believers who are persecuted and are praying for God to come and help them and God doesn't come and help them. And there's, there's a whole spectrum of that. So you can be a persecuted Christian in 17th century Japan or whenever it was, who, they were persecuted for being Christian and then they're praying, you know, come and help us. Why, give us an answer. Why is this happening? And then complete silence. And then they end up being killed or heavily tortured. And you're thinking, okay, God's hidden here. What, what explains that? But then you get the other end of the spectrum, which is what you were talking about, Ricky, which is, Hey, I'm really depressed here. Things aren't, I, do, I, I don't have the answers to a bunch of questions. I'm praying really hard to you, God, for the answers. And you are not, you, there's just complete silence here. And this is sometimes known as, uh, well, there's, there's versions of this, like spiritual dryness, always sounds like a dodgy term, but spiritual dryness is this idea that, you know, you're just not feeling it and you're trying, but you're just not feeling it. Uh, and you're not getting the answer. So divine hiddenness is an interesting argument that can that can cover a lot of bases. And it sounds like that was really prevalent for you. Yeah. And, and, and you could say that, you could say that, well, God answered my prayers and told me to turn to psychology but then that pulled me out, out of the church. So then it's like you could say to the people at church, maybe the devil's deceiving you and you're in a man-made religion and you should be somewhere else. You know, it, it, as many so, as you could go down to that one. Yeah. So you've got this really strict church that has very, very um, conservative ideas about everything. Uh, and in fact, um, what I think, was it Trude earlier on said? I might have to rewind a little bit. Where was it? Uh, la, la, la. Here it is. Uh, so Trude said it is paradoxical uh, that a system that strongly defends masculine dominance simultaneously portrays boys as so weak that they easily allow themselves to be led out of salvation and into temptation by sinful girls in short skirts. Uh, and, but, and, and you haven't mentioned it, but there, there is a very much a, a, a sexist domineering side to the religion uh, but we've got this controlling centralized network and community um that that speaks on behalf of god to you as a lay person uh, and probably is if you are at church telling everyone your deepest darkest secrets so that they can give you forgiveness so everyone knows your your sins and it's all a bit dodge and then i presume a bit like maybe the uh, mormons where you know all your businesses are intertwined and like everything's kind of a bit in-house i'm i'm guessing a lot here you know yeah. correct me if i'm wrong no, you're on the right path. So, yeah. 
So, so J. Dub No Mo, who's a former Jehovah's Witness, saying it's really similar to Jehovah's Witness by the sounds of it. Do they shun and or kick people out this fellowship like JWs if someone disobeys and it's known? Or what's the discipline like? And thank you so much for the super chat question, J. Dub. That's a really good couple of questions there. So, what's it? Do you get kicked out? Um, or are there just not enough people in these churches that you can't afford to kick people out? And, and what's the discipline like in these communities? They they don't shun no they don't shun like the uh, Jehovah Witness that do. Um, it's 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 a little like it's more more like you're kind of dangerous to be around. So like if I were to you know ask somebody to come to my house, they wouldn't come, but they'd say you're feel free to come to my house, you know, because I usually say like, don't go to the world, but you can have the world come to you. So if I was to call up an old friend and say, Hey, you want to come over? He'd say, well, why don't you come into my house? Mm -hmm. They wouldn't, you know, come here. (laughs) Is Um, that that the first sign that you know that you're in, you're in the bad books of the community? You're like, Hey Jim, do you want to come around (laughs) around mine for a cup of coffee? You're like, "Uh, how about you come around mine? I'm like, yeah, is it me? Oh, it's me, isn't it? Yeah. And kicking, kicking people out. Um, no, I've, I've never, haven't heard anybody like being kicked out. Um, what has happened, you know, not too often in the past, but there have been preachers that have, you know, you're when you're you're asked by the congregation to be a preacher. So it's it's kind of like the Mormons where they have their bishops and all that. It's like you're asked, but you're not allowed to say no. When you're asked, you're doing it. And so there have been preachers that, you know, it's very rare, but have had a personal issue where they kind of get dismissed or like. Or I know one guy in the 70s that started having meetings at his own home or whatever, and that was frowned on, and he was just like, you're no longer a preacher. And then he had a split and went and did his own thing or whatever. But you know, Hey, so can I jump clear. in on that for a yeah, quick second? Because yeah, yeah. this reminds me of a funny little anecdote. And um, not to not to put my dad on blast, but um, <laughs> I remember... <laughs> put me on I was, blast. I got thick skin. I, got I thick remember when I, was, um, when I was younger, I actually asked about that specifically. And I said... Um, something like so god picks the preachers right and he was like yeah and i was like and god knows everything that's going to happen already right like in the future and stuff and yeah yeah god knows what's going to happen and stuff i was like has any preacher ever been dismissed or left or stepped down and um he was like yeah and i was like so why would god appoint a preacher ahead of time knowing that he's going to step down and not just appoint somebody that's going to be um better and maintain the position like it doesn't make any sense and I, I can't remember what you said, but it it was probably, it probably lot, the it was, standard answer. We don't know why God does the things. It was does. something, yeah, something. Eat your like, vegetables and be quiet. <laughs> yeah, something, something so like that. So this, this, uh, these are don't get me started, Austin, yeah. because <laughs> I like these arguments about divine for divine foreknowledge, right? The uh, the idea that God is fully omniscient and knows all future events, including freely will events. If you believe in free will, I don't believe in free will, but forget that. But. Divine foreknowledge is the single biggest thorn in the side of God because it makes no sense of virtually everything that happens because you have to then start explaining all the bad, terrible things like, well, God knew that was going to be and then didn't do anything about it. And in fact, designed it such that that would be the case. Mm -hmm. It's like God designed the world such that this priest would be elected or made a priest and then does all this dodgy stuff. It's like that is God's design. Literally, he knew that would happen and created the world such that that would happen anyway. So, yeah, that's that's the thing is if you would kind of accept those those axioms you know god knows what, what's going to happen created everything such that it would happen that way and had a choice as whether or not to create it another way then you can't really wriggle out of his responsibility for any given situation yeah and then you it, it you know that stuff like that always makes you think like why why is it that i feel like my moral standard for a lot of those things would be higher than god's then you know like there's so many things that are allowed to happen that I could myself could never allow to happen. So it's like, you know, why would you worship a God that's willing to allow, you know, children to be molested? And it's like, if I had the power, I would never allow that, you know? it's Yeah. Yeah. And then you're talking about like skeptical theism as the go to like get out of jail free card. So skeptical theism, for, for those who don't know, is this idea that we either can't know or don't know the mind of God. And so therefore, any terrible thing from stubbing your toe in the morning to genocide or 230,000 people dying in a tsunami, it's like, why did I stub my toe? Why did 230,000 people die in a tsunami? Well, God moves in mysterious ways. We don't know. There could be a reason. Therefore, there is a reason. And don't think about it too much. It's just God moves in mysterious ways. Yeah. Okay. 
Thanks, grow, yeah, and growing up in a strict environment where every every Sunday you're 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 taught the fear of hell. I mean, it's 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 conditioned into you. It's 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 just repetitive. You know, hell, hell, hell. You know, scary description of hell. All this stuff. And you're thinking, okay, if if my child is to come to me and and beg me to send him to hell and punish him for something he's done, I wouldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't even let him go there for 10 seconds. And then, you know, so you get into those thoughts too. It's like, well, why would God send somebody to, you know, allow them to go to hell because they came to church with open toed shoes on and they didn't repent. Yeah. It's like that, that, that's a cruelty that it just doesn't, you know. Doesn't yeah. Make so sense. that disconnect between like a finite sin of, of very small, like proportions and then eternal conscious torment ect it's called so the idea that hell that you're going to eternally be tormented if that's the kind of hell you believe in it just that doesn't jive that's that doesn't work uh, so do you think that hell that kind of hell was that hell belief prevalent in your community and do you think that was a damaging belief very very much so i mean that's fear fear is what uh you know keeps people in line I mean, you just, you think, you think for, you know, especially when you think of like the such simple little things that you've done that were considered a sin and, and you didn't repent of when you died, you know, they, you know, preachers are warned a lot of times, like, what if you were in a car accident, you had the music blaring and then you're dying and this music is blaring and it would feel like you're going in, you're in hell and stuff like that. And you don't have a chance to repent. And to think that somebody would suffer for, you know, a quadrillion years later, they're still suffering because they had the music blaring when they got an accident and died. That's, you know, but the thing is when you're conditioned Sunday after Sunday, you are, you know, fear of hell is just, is pounded into you. And, you know, and just people think, well, you know, lucky I'm in this church and I, you know, I better you know, get up and ask for forgiveness and weep and repent because I don't want something to happen to me after church and I haven't cleared my conscience. But the thing is, even by the time you go up, ask forgiveness from somebody, you sit back down. How many times have you sinned already? How many times have you thought something inappropriate? Mm-hmm. I mean, you guys, you're, you're supposed to, repent for your thoughts and you know you had yeah uh, thoughts it, and it's that, that and, kind of like control and like totalitarian authoritarian control that both Listedius and all his representatives like all these elders and preachers have right it makes me wonder what kind of people they are I often think about this like Paul of Tarsus, St. Paul, right? What kind of person was he that, that made him say all those things? Was he genuinely a real, like, uh, fundamental evangelical believer? Or was this about him getting control over people in the sense of, was he getting donations of money to him? You know, what was driving him in the real world to, to, to do and say the things he did? Uh, and and the same with th- these preachers or these priests or pastors i don't know how you define them and listadius himself it's like what kind of person are what kind of people are these people that are they people that really desire control are they very controlling people that 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 led them to you know led listadius to do that i don't suppose we can answer that question now in in hindsight but do you do, when you look at the preachers do you, are they just fit for purpose they they don't like the preachers in the church have um regular full-time jobs and they're they're not paid for their position but they do they do get uh people giving them money giving them you know to help them travel and stuff like that and i'm I'm not sure how much money they have are and and how much they i don't know if they give if they use what they need for expenses and give the rest back to the church i don't know the details of that and the church is very open with their community and their you know what with, with their finances and all that stuff but you know they're they're conditioned from birth the way same way we're all conditioned so i you know they're conditioned yeah. to believe that this is the way things are so you know they're doing what god wants them to do so i you know as i can't really speak on like how much control they if they you know enjoy having that control i i can't imagine they enjoy being a preacher because it comes with a lot of burdens <laughs> I mean, you got to be on call for people and to help people, and you're, like I said, it's not a paid position. So, yeah, I remember speaking to Bruce Garenzo. Go and check the interview I did with him, as I said uh, some weeks ago, and he was talking about how uh, preachers end up being and pastors end up being experts in everything to everyone, but not actually being those experts. And so they're they're not trained in mental health, they're not trained in relationship 
um, counseling. They're not trained in all these different things. And yet everyone goes to them thinking that they are, you know, being conduits of God, the answers to all their problems. And of course, it can just go wrong because they're they are not giving you know, good advice, I guess. Um, so for you guys, uh, what were the challenges of deconverting? And I guess maybe Austin didn't being off at university and loving life and going, hey, it turns out that God doesn't exist. So I'm going to go down a bar and just drink with my friends and be normal. Whereas, you know, Ricky's like, 20 years down the line of some mental health issues, uh, you know, struggling with feeling things in his head, but not allowing himself, not being allowed to express those feelings, then casting off the belief system. Uh, what, what, what were the social, what was the fallout, the, the communal fallout and the familial fallout for you, say Ricky, in your deconversion? Well, what, uh, like when I first realized that I, I can no longer, you know, go to this church. Like, it's just, I, I can't be here. Um, at first, well, I should say at first, when I realized, that, you know, that I can no longer be a part of it, or I was no longer a believer is a better way to put it. You know, I was concerned about, okay, my wife, as far as I know, is still a believer. And so I had thought about it for, you know, several weeks, like, you know, trying to think what what's the best way to handle this. And I got to the point where I thought, you know what? I'll just, I'll, I'll, I don't want to disrupt, I don't want to pull the rug off under her. I don't want to disrupt our home or whatever. I don't want to cause her un, undue stress for this. I thought, I'll just keep going to church with her. If I have to go the rest of my life, I'll come here every Sunday, but I'll just kick back and chill out, you know, just <laughs> zone out. <laughs> um, so I did that for many months. I don't know how long it was. It was nine months or a year, probably not a year, but close to that. And, and uh, I mentioned our last one too. It was kind of fascinating to be sitting there and, you know, hearing the preacher saying things where, you know, if I I'd hear them say things wrong or get things wrong or, or quote, like so-and-so, you know, wrote this part of the Bible. And I'd be like, in, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, no, no, that's that, you know, that was the apostle Paul or whatever, you know? So that was fascinating. So, you know, I just do that. Um, but I could tell that, my wife was starting to bring up things that were problematic, but like kind of the subtle way you do in those high control environments where she's saying, well, just enough to like kind of see what my thoughts are and stuff, but afraid to make a statement, you know, and I could see that she was thinking about stuff. So I thought I might be getting closer where I can just tell her how I feel. And then one day from her walk, she told me, she said, she said something that was, I could tell was, you know, really problematic for her. And I was like, this is my opportunity. Boom, I told her, I don't feel comfortable going to the church anymore. I said, I, you know, I've learned so much. I've, you know, through psychology, through human behavior, through the Bible, um, I just can't go anymore. And she was like, you know, kind of stunned. And then we had conversations every single evening for months. We go for long walks every night and just talk and talk and talk through this stuff. And, you know, it turns out we were actually closer in our thoughts than I had realized. But we we're both afraid probably to scare each other, you know, wow. I don't think oh, I'm losing my wife. She's going to hell or if I'm losing my husband, he's going to hell. Well, no, the things we found problematic were, you know, very similar. So now, now what, you know, how are we going to handle this? Cause it, it's from all, you know, I've seen so many stories. I know how it goes that in Mormons and Jehovah, well, Jehovah is a lot more extreme, but Mormons and that too, it's like, you're going to lose your community. People are going to consider you dangerous. I was like, I know, I know that people are going to tell me the devil has me. Um, you know, I'm lost, all this other stuff. And I, so it's like I had to plan, like prepare, like, okay, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. You know, I've seen this stuff happen before. So I just kind of prepared for it. And I thought when I leave, I know a few people are going to come talk to me. I didn't know how many. Um, and like I said, six to eight or people are talking to me. But I was prepared. I thought all I can do, they're going to come to me, look at me, say you're lost. The devil has you. And all I can do is just ask them tough questions about history, Christianity, and about their prophet Lestadius. And I thought, what this is going to do is it's going to disarm them. It's cognitive dissonance is going to set in. They're going to want to shut down the conversation and then they'll leave. And that's typically what happened. I use a lot of street epistemology and, you know, Anthony Montevasco, that's his, I learned quite a bit from him too. So it was like, you ask questions that make people think, and it's such a stressor on them that eventually they're going to shut down. Uh, the thing is that Anthony learned is, you don't go on too long. You do it for a short period of time, 20 minutes or less. They walk away and then they have questions. I'd go too long and then they just shut down. 
Look at yeah, it. I mean, it's, it's, it's very much like a, a Socratic dialectic, which yeah, is Socr exactly. Socrates was very famous for winning arguments just by asking questions. Yeah. So you ask these leading questions, a bit like coaching, and then, you know, you ask these questions and hopefully the, that person, you know, has a bit of a mental breakdown and then they have to deal with that. And that's you, in a sense, winning an argument just by asking questions. I, well, there's a really interesting idea, before I get onto what Ricky's opinions of your deconversion were, but there's a really interesting dynamic going on which is the most important person in, in your life i'm assuming at this time is, is your wife right you are supposed to have this closest relationship where you are you are almost like one or you, the, you don't hold anything back from from the other person significant person in your life right normally uh, but here you here you are unable to actually talk about the most existential thing in the world which could condemn you to hell or, or at least, uh, you know, and so, and so that that tension that then that must have been some like mental health issues. Just trying to second guess what the hell was going on, what was going on with your wife. Like, I really, really want to speak to her about this because this is so all-consuming and it is basically everything. And I can't say a word to her, type thing. So then, I, I, I is that would that is that about right? Was that yeah, a and, period? Yeah, and we, I mean, we've been married twenty nine years. We've been together thirty three years. We in our entire relationship from dating to marriage, we've only been apart from each other only a few times. And it was usually only for a day or two. I and mean, we were, we're together a lot. I mean, she's my best friend. I love hanging out with her. It's like, I mean, if I, if I could choose to do anything, it's like hang out with her. I've been able to go for a walk or just do anything, you know, we enjoy each other's company, but yeah, you have that one thing, that one big looming thing that, you know, you're just, it is, it's stressful because it's like, it's like you got to think and think and think how, how do I navigate this you know how do I, I don't want to disrupt our marriage we have you know we have a good relationship we communicate and talk about everything but then it's like this one scary issue when you got <laughs> heaven and hell on the, the line room. yeah yeah it's just, and and when I when I was able to when I was able to just tell her I don't feel comfortable with church and I don't want to go anymore and it was you know it was, it was awesome how quickly she was able to accept that you know she asked me a few questions right away you know, just kind of gauge, like, what does that mean? Like you said with Austin, that you just all of a sudden like, oh, you don't care about anything now. You're just going to do whatever you want. You know, you know, that's what she's you know, afraid of. Is like, I'm just going to just be whatever. Just going like, to murder babies. Like, <laughs> yeah, really? I was like, no, not at all. It's, in fact, my life has changed very little. I mean, I, I, I'm still the same person, except, except for, I don't believe in, you know, that. Just thought even except you're not going to go to hell for bodybuilding, right? That, yeah that's, exa that's exactly good. yeah and that's <laughs> that's something else we can talk about talk about later that's uh fascinating and uh when you when you had asked earlier too when you were talking about like for austin what it was like when when he left and how our experiences are different because you know he's in college you know and when i did it i'm in my mid-40s and stuff like that and like how it was different you know leaving that um i'd say that once i realized i need to look at everything and build that foundation and 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 it just goes through and research as much as I can and like find where, where ideas. I mean, a lot of the times you can't find like the actual origination point of an idea, but as far back as you can to like, where did this idea came from, come from and how did it morph over time and stuff like that. When I would reach any new evidence, I was able to pivot quickly. And Austin, and I've talked about that where Austin said his brain's the same way. You see evidence that's contradictory to what your bias is or what you believe you know, we're able to pivot quickly to say the truth is more important than trying to hold on to something that isn't true. And so you'll, you'll see most people, they look for, you know, the stuff to confirm their biases. And so like when they do what they call research and stuff like that, their research is finding things that confirm their bias and then saying, well, I know this isn't right because I found this. And it's like, yeah, but the evidence shows this and they just don't want to think about it, you know? Well, when I was able to find different things, like especially on the on hell, when you do look back at, and you find how how much of hell that people know today or know today is a human construct, and it's pulled from all kinds of you know mythology, and in like in the Old Testament, there's no there's no mention of hell in the Old Testament, just Sheol, it's just the grave, a neutral term, and it's like once I learn these things, like pivot quickly, it's like oh, this hell that you're afraid of that's described you. It doesn't exist. That was pulled from the imagination of men. I have evidence that shows that it is, you know, so. 
It's, it's lovely that um, your wife has clearly come on and, and put her tuppence in here. I absolutely knew he was struggling, but I didn't want, uh, I didn't know what exactly was wrong. Uh, I was happy he was able to finally explain why, and that, that's obviously fantastic. Yeah, and what I, um, what, I, what I do is I'd shut down. I just get, I'd get very insular. I just, I just go into myself, and so it's like I was, I was at home existing, living, breathing. But I was a zombie because everything was going on in here. You know. So, so Austin, you you ha- were away at university, I presume, just living your life as a fairly typical person, uh, making assumptions here. Uh, you might be just a no. He was he was weird. at home, which caused mm-hmm. the, which was. I mean, we we should talk about this, and you can put me yeah. on blast too. But <laughs> well, so I'm interested in in so. Austin, you kind of deconverted before your dad, right? So, what did you feel your dad thought of you deconverting, or did you keep it quiet? Like, like, did he have a sense? Uh, how did he he react to that? Uh, and then vice versa, what did you see of your dad's deconversion, and how did you how what were your experience of that, and what did you feel about that whole situation? Yeah, so um, you know, in my case. Um, you know, my, my folks weren't happy about it at all. So, um, and I can understand why when you have that mindset and that framework, um, that has been established over all those years, um, that the church gave them and then to get the, um, rug pulled out from you like that with one of your own children, I'm sure it's extremely troubling, right? You worry about things like, well, they're going to go to hell now and, and things like that, or, oh, maybe they're, will do all of these bad things because they don't have our moral framework anymore. Right. Maybe he's going to go out and I don't know, do drugs or something. Right. So I can imagine there's many things that you would worry about. Um, and it, it's, you know, it sucks to have to, um, cause that kind of discomfort to people that you care about by telling them something like that, but you can't keep it bottled inside forever and you have to be who you are and the person that you're going to become. So it's much better if, you know, I figured to, eventually just get it out there and um and then contend with it and deal with it and you know see what comes of it than to just you know not be who you are or live a lie just to please other people so it certainly caused a disruption um but did did ricky did you see elements of his deconversion that triggered off certain things in your mind were like you yeah, I do see that as a problem. So I, I kind of get you. Would you did did I, I guess did Austin's deconversion trigger an internal dialogue with yourself? No, and it, it <laughs> no, no, and I'll, he's a loser. I'll, he's a loser, and he's wrong. And I'll he's gonna explain help. why. Um, I mean, obviously, I, I loved him, and the the first reaction, you know, for myself is you're thinking, I'm responsible. You know, I felt responsible for what happened to him. And like, you know, going through high school, anytime Austin, I, I was very, I had very much binary thinking for just about everything, you know, in the raising environment I was mm-hmm. and, you know, in the culture I was. And so everything was like black and white. So, you know, Austin would do well in school, but then if there's any time where he'd slip a little bit, I would, it's like sh- the shock and awe, you, you know, it's like, you have to get your grades up. They have to be, you know, A's. You know, quit making excuses. You just do it, and that, that was it. I was I wasn't empathetic. I didn't, you know, wasn't I wasn't encouraging in the right way, and I also felt, you know, a lot of guilt about that. But then, you know, he he worked hard. He, he you know, just like any kid, you have your little times where you kind of just ease back a little bit, and then I'm there to pressure him. I wanted him, you know, I knew he was capable of. I knew he was a smart kid, and I was I wanted him to get straight A's, get great scholarships, and go to school, and and I wanted him to chase, you know education which I, you know also i knew he's capable of it but i know a part of me too in the back of my mind was like i missed out on what i should have had you know i i really wish i could have went had the opportunities that austin had and i could have if i was raised in a different environment but the problem is in in austin was he did well and he got a lot of good scholarships he's he i mean he you he graduated from college with almost almost no debt because scholarships paid for you know most of it and stuff but then I, and even going to college, he wasn't sure his first year. I don't know what I want to do. Maybe I won't go. And I was like, no, you're going. You start, you're going to find your way. You know, you're going to eventually find your path. So I, we just threw him into marketing. You know, it's like, just start, get some of those nuisance classes out of the way. And then, you know, he found his rhythm with biology and that was it. He was gung ho. 
well, then I feel guilt because it's like, okay, I pushed him hard to get to college. I sent him on, you know, I felt responsible. I sent him on his path. I did all this paperwork to get him into college. And now he's in biology. Now he's, you know, they've converted from my religion. And now he's going to hell. And I felt like it's my fault. I I pushed him here. And now he got he got to the education that I was wanting to get in, you know, into university. I didn't want him to go on the path that was going to bring him to hell, you know. So I felt mm. so guilty. I felt mm. a lot, tremendous amount of guilt. And I remember and when that's, he told that, me, that's that damaging notion of that hell belief, isn't it? That it can just like it's always hanging over you, and it, it's like the ultimate uh, shitstorm for any decision you ever make. Or and it's like, oh, but oh my god, he's going to get a hell, and it's yeah. my fault. And, which and, is and kind of which it makes you then. Sorry, Ricky, it oh, makes no, you then so. understand. Um, why people go out and witness, you know, because this is a thing, this is an American thing, particularly. We don't do it in Britain. We're all very much Church of England, or we go to a church on Sunday and sing a dirge and then drink some tea and eat biscuits. And where, whereas in America, you get people standing on street corners. Oh, well, that's not very British. We don't do that. Ooh, it's shouting about religion. We keep that quiet. But but you shout about it and you witness. And But then I kind of understand that because it's like, of course they're going to witness because if, if these guys don't come to believe in the true Christianity, they are going to go to hell for eternity. And that, there's nothing worse than human conception. So I am obligated, surely, to do that. So hell is always there, isn't it, if you believe in it? Yeah, and if it, it is painful and painful and difficult as it was when Austin told us how he felt and, you know, he moved out of the house and obviously he didn't want to be around, you know, we were like, I mean, it's hard to be around people that are trying to, pressure you into going to church and stuff like that was that a thing for you austin then you, you like you you re, you reject you reacted to that kind of um religious environment but he was very respectful he never once tried to talk us out of our religion i gotta say that before he mm. before he was on yeah, yeah so I, I would only um respond um I, you know i was pretty non-confrontational so i just kind of just quit going um and so I, you know i would have probably waited even longer or said less but you know then you would have you know my parents saying like well, well you, you keep not showing up like and coming and finding me to like confront me about it so you know eventually you kind of have to, to just get it out there and and say it how you feel but in terms of actually like sitting down and sharing arguments and like okay let's let's have a debate or something right that that wasn't something that i would actively do um, only as a response to assertions that were um, that were made toward me, right? So, like, if my dad would come up and present some arguments or something, well, then now that you've put those arguments out there, I'll respond and like say why they're not convincing. And I remember um, them bringing up the embarrassing stuff of trying to convince you that you know about kinds and stuff like that. And I was coming from a pers Christian perspective, and now when I learned about you know, <laughs> you know changing yeah. of kinds and stuff like that. I, I said, there's so many things I'm embarrassed that I said when I look back at it. It's like, oh, that's coming from a place of ignorance. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I suppose that's an interesting segue. I don't know. Sorry, you may not finish saying no, what sorry, you're saying. You yeah, finish off. Sorry. Did, is, is was there more to add? Um. Well, that was. I mean, basically, kind of the big, the big gist of it was. It was more, um, based on responding, but also, yeah, I did. It. I did kind of want to be out of that environment. Um, and not, not really be around. Um people that were going to continuously like proselytize or try to get me to come back there. Um, I didn't feel like repeatedly having the same discussion over and over again with people who I knew were going to respond um, emotionally and not actually mm -hmm. want to like have a, a real discussion about those issues. It was more of like fear, anger, um, you know, you'd better start coming back here, things like that. So I wasn't interested in that. Um, if somebody wanted to actually, a family member or, or anyone wanted to actually um, discuss the arguments and these positions um, in a kind of clear, more, I guess, academic manner, then I was always happy to do that. But I didn't want to basically sit there and get you know, pressured, especially being a little bit younger at the time, right? People tend to think like, well, I'm older than you, so I know better. And I'm just going to talk to you like you're a kid and you're yep. going through a phase age, or something. Age is not equal wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love I love your like fear leads to anger. Anger, well, anger leads to the dark side. I mean, you got Darth Vader behind you there, Ricky. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it took me long enough to realize all the memorabilia. Like, oh my goodness, that's awesome. Superheroes um, and Star Wars. <laughs> 
So, uh, so I guess politics is is maybe where where we can head before we start sort of wrapping things up. But um, as so often is the case with, particularly in America, where religion is 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 a very close bedfellow with conservative politics. Uh, you know, conservative religion and conservative politics seem to be you know one and the same. Um, we can talk about the intersection there. But like, as you came out of the the shackles of your conservative religion, Ricky, uh, did you find that your politics shifted? And how, how do you feel about that? Why was that, do you think? And then, Austin, were you just always like that? Or, or you know, what was going on there? So, what you know, jump in. Yeah, for, for myself, I was a, very much a Republican. But, what, what you know, on, on reflection of that, too, is, it's fat because now I would say I'm, slightly left of center maybe um it's like i was a republican i said all the re, you know the republican talking points and since i was very since i was very much like i said in that binary mode it was like there was it was always black and white and my wife and i joke, joke about this all the time because for so many times during a marriage when i'd say there is no gray area there's black or white there's right or wrong and she'd be like no there's gray area I'm like no there's not you know I, <laughs> there's this way mm -hmm. or, you know and that's it so I do all the talking points, but I never, you know, you never do it. You never display any Socratic humility. You never, you know, you're just, you, whatever the group or social structure, whether it's religion or politics, you, you're in that tribe. And it's like, you're afraid to share anything outside of that thought because you're going to get rejected for even one thing, you know, your tribe will reject you. But what's interesting about that is, okay, I, here I am, I'm a conservative Republican. I'm, you know, voting that way. I'm thinking I'm that way. But there was always a, a part of me that had like a, it was almost like, you know, do I really, like my feelings are telling me that this isn't this way, but yet you're still, you know, and it, it's, it's it's fascinating That's when like, I reflect back on it. It's like, I wasn't as right wing as I thought I was. I was actually I think finding it problematic. A, so. a lot to be said for um political psychology and, and that defines kind of, uh, it's, it's a disposition that uh, is quite fundamental and I think shapes can shape what religion you believe in. So if you are politically liberal as your, your psychological disposition, you end up adopting a kind of, if you are going to be Christian, you're going to be a, like a New Testament, uh, Jesus is love kind of Christian. Whereas if you're a real authoritarian person and a very authoritarian um a politically conservative person then you end up adopting an old testament yahweh is a jealous god type thing and uh and i think so there is there, for me to armchair psychoanalyze you ricky would be to say that you do have elements of of just a natural liberal tendency in your psychological disposition but yeah. you had 40 years of being of that being layered over your condition with, consistently with 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 social conditioning yeah. and then with the removal of that those shackles you are then able to find out maybe who you more naturally so who I really, yeah who i really was and like you know mm -hmm. living authentically and what i i mean what's awesome is that i gained so much more empathy for people where before it's like you know you see people that have a problem with whatever it was whether it may be drug addiction or you know anything in you know previously is like in my mind it's like you're thinking why don't they just get their crap together you know why don't they, you know whatever and it's like once you once you break through that and you gain more empathy, you, you just realize, you know, you you get everybody has their struggles and and like everybody deserves love, and it's like you put all these like I said social pressures on people to be this and be that, and it's like people should just be able to live authentic and and we sh we're all worthy of love, and it just like to get to that point is so refreshing. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and what's your experience of that, um, Austin, about the, you know, was, was politics important to you, especially sort of going through college uh, and discovering who you were? Did, 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 did that, uh, was that intention with who your parents were at all or not? I don't know. Well, it was an interesting journey because, um, you know, as a child, you generally will conform to the things that your community believes, right? So the area where we live in is, is typically a pretty highly conservative area. Um, but, you know, as a child, I didn't really focus too much on that. Or as a teenager, you just kind of went along with what people thought. But um, some of the um, things that that um, 
that people around me did think. Um, there was a lot of things like homophobia, transphobia, um, uh, racist attitudes, things like that. I could never sign on to um, I, something. I always felt extremely wrong about that. Um, it was just easier to express it um, once I had deconverted because I realized how those things were correlated. That. Um, religious faith with the conservative politics and how those kind of beliefs are formed. So it was more liberating in a sense, I guess, to just be able to express who you were. But then from that point on, becoming an adult and and things like that, my my later political views were much more influenced actually by my role as a scientist than really anything to do with even religion, just because as someone who does ecology, I'm an evolutionary biology, um, that, that kind of ties in a lot with um, economics and the way that we as humans interact with the environment. So that is actually what pushed me much, much um, farther to being um, left wing than even anything religious. So the way that we interact with and do things like production and, and extraction of natural resources um, led me to look a lot more into economics and different views and perspectives. So like in the United States here, we kind of have a lot of um, tacit views on economics that don't really get mentioned right things are generally portrayed from a, a neoliberal capitalist perspective right and so i'm more of an advocate of um of a form of socialism that's based on uh, worker co-ops and democratic workplaces to kind of um eliminate a lot of the waste and excess that's produced by the profit motive of capitalism so basically don't, don't, don't get me started austin this is this is right up my alley but um <laughs> yeah yeah, I actually just to, to, I just wrote uh, an essay, uh, an article recently on um, the guy that owns Patagonia is now like uh, the the clothing company that's ethical, and he's now mm -hmm. given it over to like basically helping to save the world as in perpetuity, like fantastic. But anyway, that's an interesting way that he's modeled that company, and wonder whether that's a sustainable way of doing business. But um, anyway, that's complete. But, but but interesting what you were saying, and 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 just. Uh, leading into uh, the idea of this tribal element of politics that you see in religiosity that we've seen in as we talked about right at the beginning of the show which is you know oh you're that kind of um you know x y and z baptist and i'm this kind of x y and z baptist and therefore we hate each other it's like i'd rather be a rusky than a democrat i'd rather be a russian than a, a democrat and it's like you know, gee whiz, the Cold War is not long ended, and these are your kind of mortal enemy, politically speaking. And I'd rather be that mortal enemy than an even more mortal enemy, which is my own fellow humans in my own country who just happen to be in a different political party. And again, yeah. you can find examples of that going the other way, right? Yeah, and I don't think I don't think a lot of people realize too you know, when it comes to religion, like in religion and politics. You know, probably a lot of people that are in political parties that would say like. You know, how could you stay in, you know, a cult or a fundy religion or how could you do this or that? Meanwhile, they're in a cult. They're in a political mm. cult, you mm. know, the mega and stuff like that. I mean, that that's a cult. It's just it's not a religious cult, but it's a political cult. Mm. And interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, Very so few people are capable of the nuance of saying, well, especially criticizing somebody that's sort of, you know, like your ideological ally. You can't even criticize one thing about them and your tribe will throw you out right away. Yeah. Like, so you got to accept yeah, everything. Yeah, it's the way, yeah, identity politics works. Um, vaguely agnostic, one of uh, our members, really fantastic guy. Thank you for your support. I was a teenage Republican, <laughs> baby. Uh, or something. Uh, that's me, uh, badly singing. Apologies. Uh, but you grew out of it, so there you go. Uh, people can change. Um, so when when you were talking earlier, Ricky, about uh, your uh, not aggressive parenting of, of of your expectations of Austin, like you know, I suddenly thought I was watching The Breakfast Club. You, oh, yeah. you know, one of my one of my all time favorite films. That and there's like you know Emilio Estevez and and the stress that his parents have put on him, like wanted to be the best sportsman and you know all this and and brain as well. You know, anti Michael. Hall. Anyway, uh, just yeah, I've, I've, apo I've apologized to Austin. I I've apologized to him many times for things I said. You know, ignorant things I said. Things or things where I should have been more of a friend and been kinder. You know, because I was just, just like I said, so much binary thinking on things. And, you know, he's so many times told me that, you know, it is what it is and that's the past. And, you know, I would, it was mostly, like I said, just, I wanted the best for him, but I, you know, I was wondering how much of it was I projecting, you know, my own feelings of uh, inadequacy because I, you know, I'm, I'm so happy that he's pursuing his PhD and there's so, you know, big part of me that wishes I would have been able to go on that path if I had 
growing up in a little bit of a different culture but it's vicarious phd yeah it's like exactly. he's, he's doing it on your body you're living through him exactly. this is when, like my kids like when when both my kids i've got twin boys they're 12 now and they both got their hair cut recently they used to both have l- long hair and i was like living vicariously with my long hair because i like receded and just can't grow long hair anymore and i'm like you can't get it cut you can't get it cut like, i am living through you you've got it cut now oh i'm like samson myself i'm like vicarious samson and yeah. i've just died yeah thanks anyway uh sorry um uh so um uh, as we sort of start drawing to a close, if anyone has any questions, please get them in for uh, my esteemed guest. Uh, it's been a real pleasure speaking to him. So uh, just what 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 were like, do you think the the biggest challenges for you uh, leaving leaving Lestadianism, leaving religion, uh, both of you? Ricky, what do you think was the overriding big challenge for you? I, it, I felt I felt bad knowing that I was causing distress to like my mother and my family members and stuff like that. Interesting. Like it's so important to live authentically and, 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 but yeah, I still, you know, there's a part of me that's like, I don't want to make them feel bad or disappoint them. But that's also one of my biggest criticisms about environments like that is that they should not be conditioned like that to feel disappointed that I leave. And that's, that's what hurts me is to know that they're feeling pain because they've been conditioned by a handful of men to feel that pain. Mm. And, and it, it, it just makes me sad. And it's like, it's what it's done though, is it's inspired me to see that I, in whatever capacity I can somehow, you know, for the rest of my life, I want to be an advocate and help ex fundamentalists and ex list audience. I don't know what capacity I've looked into maybe different charities and, but for the most part, if I could just provide support to people, even if it's just listening to people, whether mm. they're still in the study in religion or not, you know, I, I, I want to help people, but I don't know. I have all the answers. I just would like to know that. It's, you know, it's quite often. Listen. It's quite often helping to provide a space. Right. But the, the Internet age that we live in has, I think, is the single biggest component of uh, the expansion of the non-religious in particularly America. Right. In Britain, we don't really care about religion and meh. But in America, it's a big thing, and it's a, it's very much your community. But uh, it's very difficult if you're living in a community to get out of that community if you're still living geographically and physically in that community, and and knowing not knowing that there's anyone else in the world that feels like you, right, and that has these same thoughts but now we've got the internet it's like oh i'm starting to have these challenges oh look there's a facebook group oh look there's a oh i can speak and then and then i can develop an online community that allows me to get some of the social hits that i need in order to yeah to that, exist and be happy yeah and that's 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 great about the internet is i've been able to connect with excellent audience all over the globe and you know we're there to support each other and you know they help me and i learned things from them as i was getting out of that and i'm you know just trying to pay it forward and that's, I mean, yeah, if, if anybody, great. if anybody's, you know, struggling with anything, they can reach out to me on Instagram or Facebook. Um, I'll keep it anonymous. If it's somebody that's in the church and it's just, you know, I, what I really feel bad for is people are strugg- struggling with like sexual identity and you know, homosexuality and stuff like that. And then that repressive environment. And, you know, there's so much, like even in Mormons, like in Utah, the suicide rate of, you know, young children and, and teenagers is, is so high. It's just heartbreaking. And, yeah. It's like if people want to reach out to me and talk to me, ask me questions, I'm not out to change anybody's mind. I'm not out to deconvert anybody, nothing. But if somebody needs somebody to talk to, find me on Instagram or Facebook. So before I ask that question to Ricky, I'm going to add add one more question for you. Uh, sorry, to Austin. For, I'm going to ask one more question to you, Ricky, which is what would you then say is the biggest piece of advice you would give to someone who is starting to have those seeds of doubt? Uh, I would I would say that Look, you know, you get to look, like you said, we've talked about a few times, it's look at the foundation of things. Like, look, look as far back as you can to, f- like, find, like, what truth is. And it's, it's, it's scary and painful. And I, I understand, you know, if you're conditioned to be afraid of information, that's, you know, that's scary. And you're worried about, I'm going to go to hell if I look at this and look at that. But actually, what you might find is, you know, truth and you can live authentically or it's like if you're conditioned that okay you're gonna you're gonna do this and you're gonna lose you know if you look into things you're gonna lose your Christianity, and you one is if you look into things you may actually find real Christianity whatever that is, 
or you may find that you're not a Christian. But, you know, it's a lot of people that have less than studying his religion are still Christians. They just realized I was in an environment that was just a high control environment, you know, and I never, I never use the word cult, but it does fit the definition of a cult. And if you do Steve Hassan's bite model, you'll, you know, you find it. I recommend this to anybody is combating mic control by Steve Hassan. Brilliant guy who found himself roped into the Moonies, got out and he's, doing good work, you know, writing books on what to look out for and stuff like that. Yeah, which reminds me, I spoke to, oh, goodness, uh, Chris Shelton, who was a former Scientologist. I've interviewed him, and he's a big one. He's been on documentaries and stuff. Uh, and he's now got a uh, a master's in cults. And and so he, he's going to check that interview out for those interested in that. Yeah, sounds uh, very interesting. Um, so, Austin, what would you the biggest challenge for you getting out or – or was it was it relatively easy apart from familial? Maybe it's those familial um, impacts. And and what would be the biggest piece of advice you could give for anyone starting to question? Yeah, I think that um, one of the biggest challenges is really learning how to navigate social interactions with people that you are still connected to that still belong um, to that church. So things like close mm. friends, right? I had very close friends um, that were. Um, members and you know they obviously know that you just don't go there anymore and having to kind of wonder what they're going to think about you or you know do they still like me as much things like that um family members right it's hard to have a a normal interaction because you know that there's kind of an elephant in the room that people don't want to address and um that is a big challenge because you want to be able to have normal healthy social interactions but um, having having that presence there of of knowing that that there's this big thing that def differentiates myself so, from those people. Well, that's really interesting. So, like, if you're sitting at like a dinner table, Sunday dinner, right, and all your family are say Lestadians or whatever, and they think you're going to go to hell because you're a non-believer, then you've only got two options really, which is like either I can't get over this. There, there's literally there's this is a horrible feeling and it's always going to go on or I can, I, I somehow convince them that hell doesn't exist. Right. So it's either an argument or it's like, we're going to be in this sort of horrible environment. I mean, that's really difficult, right? There's, there's no way of getting around that other than convincing them that they're wrong, I guess, mm -hmm. or just biting a bullet and th having a horrible sort of social environment. Right. Yeah. And that, that was a big challenge. And the thing is, is that a lot of people in, in that church just kind of go with avoidance and um, will just act differently toward you. And then, you know, once you leave like the relative's house or something, then um, then people will will gossip or talk about you or things like that. But they have a hard time. Like people have a hard time doing it like when you're around. So there's always that kind of knowing that, um, you know, as soon as I leave here, people are going to be saying saying stuff um and so it, yeah. it just makes it that's i think one of the biggest challenges and it, it makes it so you just kind of don't want to interact with people from church anymore because um you know you just rather not be a, a part of that yeah and what what's the biggest um piece of advice you would give for someone you know starting a journey yeah i think my advice would be um just don't be afraid or if you are afraid, don't let it control you and just, you know, look into the things that scare you, right? If something, if something in the back of your mind is telling you not to look into this or that topic, that's all the reason to look into it even more and find, you know, try to the best of your ability to find out what the best approximation of the truth is on whatever subject you're looking into and then contend with that after, right? There are things that are very challenging for us to have to deal with, right? Topics like, um, like death, for example, right? That's a big one. And religion helps to answer that. And that after you pass away, you get to continue living and, and go somewhere nice. Right. And, and when you really look into it, what is the evidence for that? And you, um, take an honest approach at it. There really is no good evidence, at least in my opinion, I've never seen anything to indicate that that sort of thing would be the case. You know, you're more than likely just, you're just unconscious, right? And that's a very difficult thing to deal with, um, anxiety inducing, but I would much rather have an accurate picture of what is likely to occur after I am no longer living so that I can make the most of my life right now. 
I, I guess what you're saying, uh, you just saying before, which is like if you have these nagging doubts or, or issues in your head, don't compartmentalize it. Don't don't bury it under mounds and mounds of of I don't know. I want to forget about this kind of blanket. Uh, deal with it. You know, don't compartmentalize. Deal with it. If you have a if you have a nagging problem in your head, just get it out. Discuss mm -hmm. it with yourself. Investigate it. Research it. And and find an answer that 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 at the end of the day is is rationally justified. Um, yeah, and if you're if you're in an environment if you're in an environment or a culture church culture that's discouraging you from examining things and discouraging you from information and conditioning you week after week to not look into things, um, you should wonder is that is that a healthy environment? Yeah, if you if you're being encouraged to run away from something, yeah, it's it's it rather than deal with it and and do that you know in a in a robust manner then yeah it's it's so uh as we sort of meander to the end guys what, what is is there anything that we haven't talked about anything that you've you've missed out at all uh anything you want, want to bring up i got well i got we didn't i mean there's a, there's a lot we cover this could, this could go on for uh, hours and hours so i think what i think what i'll eventually do here is i'm just going to start it off to start a youtube channel and just there's so many things i could talk about and discuss i, I could go on for hours and hours but one thing that's this is going back to Lestadius and his, which I showed you the book on on in the last uh, last time we talked is the lunatic, which is it's his psychological perspective on the biblical scholars, um, you know, biblical authors. I mean, uh, you know, pertaining to the, the uh, reconciliation with God, and th this is just a, a funny little aside that's just it's so amusing to me is that my whole life I don't how many times I've heard people say that animals they'd laugh at people animals don't have souls and they laugh at churches that have you know blessings of animals and stuff like that and it was so fascinating to find you know in the lunatic that lestadius you know he rejects dualism and he scoffs at the egotism of uh, philosophers that don't believe that animals have souls and i recently told that to a uh, um well, when when a person from the church was so sorry, he, me, he rejects dualism. So yeah, but then he says that animals yeah, do have souls. There's vital vital forces, vital forces in our bodies, organs, is what he believes. Okay. So yeah, he yeah, stops. I'm, I'm sure for the good reason. So yeah, he doesn't. Uh, yeah, he doesn't. Not, doesn't uh, you know the mind body connection is he rejects that. So we believe these are vital forces in the body's organs, and it was fascinating, you know, to learn that. You know that he believes that the animals have souls. Well, but uh, I mean, yeah, we could get this as a right old, um, interesting uh, minefield to go down or walk across. Which is, uh, if if you, I mean, I was talking about this with Joe Smith in an interview recently. He's a, a young philosopher who's a brilliant mind, and it's the idea that um, it's a it's a real problem if you don't believe that animal like the studies has actually probably got quite good reason philosophically for doing that because if if you believe sentient creatures that that uh can feel pain and suffering if you believe that they can feel pain and suffering other animals right uh and that you don't believe that it can be reconciled in heaven or in an afterlife then actually those animals are feeling pain and suffering on earth and that is that's the end of it and there, there's no nice ending for that which is actually makes god it challenges god's omnibenevolence so i i think if 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 i was a christian i would be forced to admit that animals that felt pain and suffering would have to have some kind of afterlife soul in other in order for their lives to be balanced in some way because otherwise god looks morally abhorrent Sorry, I've gone off on philosophy there, and I've, uh, you guys have oh, yeah. over, <laughs> lost the will to live. Well, uh, well, I I had kind of interpreted it as almost it was maybe a way of explaining the differentiation between um, living and non-living matter. So that was also a problem that people, um, you know, over the past few hundred years before our kind of modern understanding of biology had dealt with was what what differentiates living organisms from non-living organisms and um the soul or a vital force was some type of uh, explanation that um gave uh animals their properties of 
of being alive as opposed to a rock or a chair or a table or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's different ways of understanding what the soul is and, and uh, yeah, I mean, goodness, I've done a few videos on the soul, so go and check them out. Um, a bit of a problematic uh, idea, but yeah, interesting. So uh, any, any other nuggets to, to throw in? Austin, anything that you you uh, feel has been unsaid that you need to get off your chest? No, I mean I could uh, chat for hours and hours, but um, we're about to have supper over here pretty soon. So <laughs> fantastic! Well, look, I I really appreciate both of you coming on. I mean, it you know, in spite of, despite or maybe because of Lestadianism, you guys appear to have a very uh, nice functional family. Um, now, whether it's always been that case, I don't know. But, you know, hats off to you. It looks like you you found a, a comfortable place to exist uh, that that appears to be um, liberating in, in a really positive way. D do you feel the same? I mean, that's me psychoanalyzing you. So, uh... yeah, that, bring, that brings up a good point that I can, I can discuss real quickly is that when when I first left the church, my a preacher was talking to my wife and he told her, you know, that things aren't going to go well for you. And she said, well, why would things not go well for me? Because Ricky left the church. And he said, well, if things don't go well for you, it's going to lead him back to the church. And, you know, things like that is like, it didn't pan out that way because our family's in a better position we've ever been in and we're closer than we've ever been. And, Myself, my wife, and all of our kids are in the best spots we've ever been in our life. Like, I feel like everything is, we've all grown and learned and came together closer than ever. So things actually went better. So he, he wasn't beautiful. right. Yeah, and, and I guess it, on the flip side of that, it must be so sad when you have families that, that don't deconvert together. And where you have like a, a husband that's still there and a wife is deconverted or vice versa, or you got children do or parents do and children don't or whatever. And you have those, those families that then you have a chasm between them and then that, that's the end of the family. So it's, it's, it's really um, fantastic that you guys have, have taken that journey together and, and successfully navigated those choppy waters. Yeah. It is. And I see that you're having Tim Mills on here in the near future. And yes. uh, I know, you know, his wife's a believer still, and he's lost his belief completely. And, you know, he's a, an atheist and it breaks my heart when I hear stuff like that, like how, how like how difficult yeah. that must be for him and his children and stuff. So I really look forward to that interview. Yeah. I've talked to him personally, uh, you know, privately about lots of stuff and yeah, just um, really difficult to navigate those, those scenarios. It's just, uh, you know, heart bleeds for, for those people who just, uh, are either living a lie in 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 their communities but not at home but then the schisms that causes at home uh, it's just yeah it's really tough um uh so uh thank you so much guys really have appreciated this um uh the conversation and i hope it's provided a uh, a platform for you to express some of your feelings and, and ideas and talk about the things that are really important to you and your experiences um uh, my wife is still a Christian and it has caused friction, I imagine, as he has, as, as Dale is online on atheist uh, um, channels getting to, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, you know, his wife, does, does she believe that, that her own husband will be going to hell? Like how, how do you, I mean, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that, that your loved one, and if you really believe that your other half is going to go to hell for eternity, if that's your belief, I'm not saying it is necessarily in, in this case, but then you, surely you'd be every waking minute trying to convert your, your husband every waking minute, because your eternity is not just like 10 years in a really bad prison. Like this is literally, I mean, a billion years is a long time, but that's an infinite, infinitesimal fraction compared to eternity. Like it's nothing. A Google Plex is nothing compared to eternity. Just it's unfathomable. And so I think really what people do in those situations is just like, oh, I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to think about it. And like, yeah, there you go. Oh, it's all fine. Yeah, it's understandable. I mean, sometimes I think, boy, it, it'd be nice if I wasn't always uh, thinking. I could just chill out and just fall. I've heard so many people say it's so easy to just follow what I'm told and just do what I'm yeah, told. It goes like, back to that point yeah. we were talking about earlier, which is, do you know what? Someone else is thinking for me. That's fine. 
Yeah. Job done. Easy. Well, look, uh, really appreciate that. Uh, you, you're welcome back anytime you guys want. If, if you want to continue to chat, if you have a particular thing you want to talk about, um, uh, just thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure this will be useful to some degree, uh, at least for those who um, who are who are either in the same position as you now or maybe starting that journey that you have taken. So, uh, you know, I, hopefully this is useful. Um, your final words, Austin. Um, well, I just want to say thanks for having us on and um, giving us this opportunity to kind of talk about this. So one thing that I've been saying for a while is that um, Lestadianism in particular does not get talked about enough. So it's just not out there as much. And that needs to change. There needs to be more resources for people. There needs to be more material out there. Um, you know, a few years ago, just Googling it and looking it up, there was hardly anything. So there needs to be more out there for people to be able to see and think about these things. So thank you for providing a platform um, for that. No problem at all. And, and you know, I presume there are Facebook groups, but that's one of the first places to go, isn't it? And in those, you know, areas where people can interact, hopefully in really positive, uh, supportive ways. Um, R Ricky, what, what, what about yourself? Any final words? Yeah, I would say... Um... A couple of recommendations, like if people could go to xtoots.org, E-X-T-O-O-T-S.org. There's some information about Lestadianism and the different branches there. There also is a link to a Facebook group, a private Facebook group, if it, you know any ex-Lestadians you know, want to join that. Um, also, if you want to know more about Lestadian, Lestadianism from another ex-Lestadian, is a, a book called An Examination of the Pearl by Ed Sumanen. Um it's at examinationthepearl.org, and plus you can find his book on Amazon. But the whole book is actually on his website. That's a very Finnish name, so it sounds like it's in a right ballpark. Yeah, it's yeah. Ed Suman. He was he was in a different branch of the study. Oh, I, I, I know Ed Suman. I was just going to say, I, know, I, I, I saw you were connected him. to him on Facebook, and I was like, I got to find out how is that connect, where that connection comes from. Yeah. Oh, anyway. I, didn't realize, well, I didn't realize he was an excellent study. Uh, yeah. he, he owns Intellectual Press, which is a, a publishing company. Yeah, okay. I, I know it. Oh, yeah. And then I read, I was reading his book, and this is this is after I deconverted and was out of the church. And I was reading his book, and I loved it because I found a kindred spirit in Ed because so many things I found problematic, he had found like a decade before me. And I'm like, you know, I'm reading all these things. I'm like, I'm telling my wife, look at, you know, Ed found, you know, what, what I found, you know, and stuff like that. So, that, that was uh that was really interesting so i enjoyed oh, that good. and uh and you know one, and another party thought like i said is, is i want to support excellent audience so i told people you know reach out to me on instagram ricky.c.johnson or else find me on facebook ricky johnson on facebook and if you are a studying and you're currently in, in in a church like i said i won't i won't share your name or let anybody know you're talking to me i just i just want to support people and help people because i appreciate how much i was helped and supported by people yeah and then one other uh one other thing too related to your bunker question from the last episode who three people I want to be stuck with a bumper that bunker that aren't relatives. I made an egregious error. So uh, James Hetfield from Metallica is in and Gordon Ramsay's out because James Hetfield Metallica had much more of an impact on my life than Gordon Ramsay. So Anthony Bourdain, Arnold Schwarzenegger and James Hetfield and James Hetfield's James Hetfield's parents were Christian scientists. There's Christian science in that religion. And his song, Dyer's Eve, is expressing his frustration towards his parents for raising him in a religion that didn't prepare him for how to handle the real world. So listen Brilliant. to Dyer's Eve and bang your head. <laughs> I, I love the fact that you've been thinking about this like throwaway question of mine. And, uh, you do realize I'm going to have to, the last thing's going to be asking Austin what is. So this is going to, I probably, I'm so bad at saying goodbye, right? And stopping videos. I just go on and on and on. And like, oh, yeah, oh, no, after this, that's it. Yeah. yeah. But uh, Austin, okay. So one of my last questions in my quick fire questions I give, I didn't do quick fire today because there's two of you and, slightly different dynamic and whatnot but one of them is you're going to get your face eaten off by a horde of zombies um spam number four i've written a, a zombie series um dystopian future so you know get yourself uh these books uh but anyway that's relevant so you're going to get your face eaten off by a horde of zombies you get a chance to just run down your bunker that you've handily prepared um where you can hang out for a month but and you get time to take three people uh, with you, but they can't be your family or friends. Who would you take to live with in a bunker for three months? Oh, uh, yeah, oh one month. yeah, one this month. Is, sorry, one it, month. Three friends, one month. It, it's real. These type of questions are so tough for me. I'm always so indecisive. So, um, 
you got to you, know, you got to do it. There's no time. You literally you're being chased down. Your face. Is, any, anyone, right? Know. Living, living or dead, right? Yep. Um, well, I guess I would, I would need someone to keep conversation with for long periods of time. So I'd want um, probably a philosopher and a scientist, and then some form of entertainment. So um, maybe um, David Hume, um, JBS Haldane. Ooh. And um, the notorious B.I.G. to um, spit some hot bars while we're when we need entertainment. See, we do think like because I was thinking James Hetfield would do the entertainment. Anthony Bourdain would cook the food, and then Arnold in his humor. And plus, we could talk about bodybuilding. My base is covered. But yeah, but I mean, you've gone metal. He's gone rap. So you yeah, know, there's 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 a ma- I, your f- family's got more, your family's got more issues than I thought. So um, I'm so, and I don't think you can get over that. Uh, really, like it, yeah. Anyway, I was, I was going to go down another rabbit hole, but I won't. Of course, I won't. So thank you so much to the super chat. Just putting chindies up there. Um, a really great support from all of you. A great discussion in the um, in. Uh, the, the live chat uh, was a great discussion. Thanks to you all. Austin's Bunker Choices. We have just had that. So, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed. Anyway, um, as ever, you know, uh, question everything, particularly yourselves. You are the easiest, as Richard Feynman, the physicist said, you know, the easiest person to fool is yourself. So, you know, try not to do that. He didn't say it like that, but that's me. Um, and uh, please like, subscribe, share, uh, hit the bell. I don't even know that I've got a bell, but everyone says that. Uh, if you see a bell around, just hit it. <laughs> just in your house if you've got a bell just hit the bell and i say jonathan ms pitt has told me to do this i was just hitting a bell um uh and uh thanks for all your support uh until next time toodle pips and massive big love to my guests and to uh mum and wife who is is not here but has been commenting in the live chat so great family and really interesting stuff thanks so much guys uh, until next time everybody yeah. goodbye